All right, so good morning, guys. Uh, this week we got to finish off polyphenols because of the issue we had last week, but uh, we understand what happened last week it won't happen again. At least that won't happen again, because at least now we know. So, uh, anyways, if it ever, uh, apparently, if you start the uh, broadcast on campus, then I can't log in. Uh, so that's was the issue, but we got to figure it out now. Okay. So today, the plan is to finish the polyphenols, and then I'm going to do the alkaloid section. Now, um, there could be a class in that room, and if there is, you may get kicked out But uh, at the end of the lecture. But I'm going to have to go longer in order to cover the information that we didn't do last week, uh, potentially. I might be able to finish it, but I don't really want to have to rush through uh, just to cover that extra material. So. I may go half an hour later and it will be recorded. If you need to, you can watch it. And uh, I think that's better than just trying to squeeze it all in and going through it pretty quick. The other thing I've done is posted some questions for the exam. Um, and if you guys have some exam questions, please ask me during um, the break or make a list and uh, I might be able to answer them uh, on the video or I will answer them on the uh, discussion board there, okay? I think that's it. Uh, I can talk about the exam at the very end of this recording or this lecture as well, like how many questions and how it's divided, okay? So, um, so right now we're just gonna finish off the polyphenol section. Main area that we're talking about last week uh, for polyphenols were the flavonoids and all the different types that they had. Remember, there was uh, flavonoids, flav flavones, um, uh, flavones, uh, the uh, uh, anthocyanins, and now we're going to go into a group of uh, polyphenols called tannins. This does overlap with some of the things that we've already discussed, okay? Actually, we've already discussed, discussed this in two sections, but we're going to summarize it again here just to uh, make more sense of it. So what plant tannins are, uh, these are phenolic compounds that basically are able to bind proteins. In particular, I think where it's binding is the nitrogens in the, in the amino acids and the proteins. And when it does that, it can form like a cross-linking that uh, allows proteins to precipitate or, or basically causes proteins to precipitate out of solution. Um, and with your skin, what it does when you apply it to an open wound or to your mucous membranes is that these tannins will go in there and bind up the proteins in the skin and pull it together and kind of form a cross-linking. And it has uh, two functions. It kind of helps to tighten up the skin and thereby it can help to arrest bleeding, okay? So if you uh, apply it to an open wound, like if you're shaving, you can apply uh, a, uh, an astringent compound to stop the bleeding. Um, that's one thing that it does. And the other thing it does is it kind of creates a second uh, tougher layer of skin. And appreciate, tannins are used to tan animal hides. And when you tan an animal hide, Normally, skin is very uh, flexible. When you add tannins to it, it makes it thicker and more rigid to make leather, okay? So literally, when you're taking tannins uh, internally or applying it to your skin, you're altering in a physical way the nature uh, of those, uh, of those uh, mucous membranes or your skin to make it thicker, more resistant to trauma. Um, the advantage of this is... Um, it can also help wound healing by tanning it so that then you're less likely to get infections to bind to it, okay? So uh, there are some disadvantages of this, though, is if you drink a whole bunch of tannin-rich foods. Uh, for example, if you've ever had, like, a very oaky wine on an empty stomach, you'll get gut rot. And that's because it starts changing the uh, proteins and the transporters in your gut. And... In your intestinal tract, it'll affect some of the um, various enzymes and transporters involved with nutrient absorption. So it can affect the mucous membrane, make it less permeable, permeable in, the, in the intestinal tract, 
but it can also directly bind up certain compounds like minerals uh, and make them less bioavailable, okay? So that's why it can affect nutrient absorption and ion chelation. The other thing is appreciate high amounts of tannins are toxic. Like these things are good in small amounts, but high amounts, um, if you were able to absorb them all, it's going to irritate the bowels, liver, and kidneys, um, and you could potentially overdose on them. So unlikely to occur in your diet, but uh, like we can't live on acorns, for example. Acorns are very, very stringent. They come from oak trees. And animals like squirrels uh, have uh, compounds or enzymes that can help to uh, break them down, okay? So there are two main types of, of uh, tannins that you will see in herbal medicine. Uh, there are hydrolyzable tannins, and there are um, the non-hydrolyzable tannins. Now, the hydrolyzable tannins are basically glycosides, so sugar-containing um, sugars attached to either gallic acid or lagic acid, typically speaking, uh, form up the hydrolyzable tannins. And you'll get these in um, oak bark, for example, also herbs like witch hazel. Uh, the rind of pomegranate is particularly astringent, uh, you can find it there. Also in tea, so you've probably heard of gallic a um, tannic acid. Um, that can be extracted from tea. Um, one of the reasons why I think you people add a little bit of milk to their tea is to get rid of that astringent uh, effect. Um, and it helps to bind up the tannins to the milk because the milk contains protein so that it doesn't irritate the gut or bind up minerals, okay? So on the left-hand side, gallic acid is shown at the bottom there. This is uh, on a, this is an oak tree. And on the oak tree, you see that big, big kind of tumor-like structure. It's called a gall, or G-A-L-L. -L. And um, they can form on uh, herbaceous plants as well. They're basically a, a kind of a like a tumor-like growth, uh, not cancerous, but usually what happens is the bud, the tree, or the plant is infected by something. And one of the techniques for the trees that helps tries to wall it off, uh, and it pumps in high amounts of gallic acid and other um, astringent molecules into it. And so. This part of the plant tends to be even more stringent than other parts of the plant. Sometimes this is desired for um, people who are trying to do tanning and stuff. And then on the right-hand side, you've got pomegranate. And elagic acid is found in pomegranate, but also in other things like raspberries as well, certain herbs uh, like agrimony. And I'm only showing you the aglycone. Now, remember, the aglycone is the non-sugar-containing comp component, okay? But... Um, these can be, by adding acid and heat, you can break it apart and just liberate these gallic acid or lagic acid molecules, okay? These are good antioxidants. And appreciate, because there are so many OH groups that are available, um, I would imagine if you're binding a sugar to it, you don't, it's still going to have some function, even if there's a sugar, a glycoside form of this, it's still going to have sugars attached to it uh, and still have some of these uh, stringent things. I suspect the OH is... In particular, is what, what forms cross-linking with the uh, uh, with the proteins in your skin. Now, the second type of tannins are the condensed tannins or non-hydrolyzable tannins, and this is related to the uh, anthocyanins, so a type of flavonoids. And I don't know if you remember we had oligomeric proanthocyanidins. These are stacked polymers uh, of the anthocyanidins, and You'll find this in lots of pigmented fruits and vegetables. So blueberries and cranberries and bilberries and elderberries and grapes. They will have an astringent quality to them as well. It tends not to be as, as astringent as the hydrolyzable tannins, in my opinion. Um, I think it probably depends on uh, the plant. And some plants will have both hydrolyzable and non-hydrolyzable tannins in it. But... If you've ever taken blueberries and uh, added hot water to thaw them out and then sip the water, you'll find your mouth puckers a little bit, okay? Uh, and that's that puckering effect. The same as what you get in green bananas, although I think those are more the hydrolyzable tannins uh, in the bananas. So in herbal medicine, they have a number of uses. They can be used for uh, both hydrolyzable and non-hydrolyzable -hydro tannins can be used both internally and topically for different types of ulcers, whether it's a stomach ulcer or whether it's 
um, a, uh, some kind of wound that can be used to stop bleeding. So if someone had topical bleeding, it's called a styptic, where they use it for like shaving uh, or wound healing. Uh, internally, if you had things like uh, hemorrhoids or uh, ulcerative colitis, it could be used for things like that as well. They do have antioxidants associated with it um, in general and going to have some anti-inflammatory effects as well. So with the tannins, again, they're coming from these simple phenolic compounds. When you have uh, something like gallic acid, that's a simple phenolic. You pop two of these guys together, you now have a polyphenol. And when you add a bunch of sugar to it, then you have a glycoside of these, and that becomes a hydrolyzable tannin at the top, and that one's in pomegranate. And then the tannic acid shown in the middle there is a glycoside of gallic acid. And then at the bottom, you have these oligomeric proanthocyanidins, uh, which are made from anthocyan anthocyanidins stacked together to make a polymer. Okay, So those are your two main types. The difference between the hydrolyzable tannins and the condensed tannins is adding acid or heat to the condensed tannins will not liberate the individual uh, compounds, okay? So uh, these condensed tannins are not acting as, or not existing necessarily as uh, glycosides, okay? Any questions? So polyphenols, we're still on that topic. Now we have another group called lignans and flavonolignans. These are not entirely new. They're just sort of uh, what's formed when you stick a couple of things we've already talked about together. Okay? So with the lignans, I'm going to start with those guys. Lignans are basically formed from two phenylpropanoids. Remember the phenylpropanoids have the... Um, the phenolic ring, and then they'll have three carbon side chain. So when you stick two of these guys together, you get the lignans. Lignans are pretty neat little compounds. In flax, uh, flaxseed in general is rich in lignans. And what's neat about flax is, one, because they're a polyphenol, they're going to have that antioxidant effect. Two, because of their uh, alignment in three-dimensional space, they act as phytoestrogens. And so they help to modulate some of those estrogen receptors. They're not very stimulating. And what's neat about flaxseed, it's been shown to reduce the risk of breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. Uh, in addition to that, because of the antioxidant effects, they help to protect you from atherosclerosis. Uh, they're going to have some anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, and then just as an aside, flax, flax seeds also have rich amounts of omega-3s and also mucilage or soluble fiber. So if you're not eating flax, you should be eating it every day. I eat it almost every single day, It's uh, unless we run out of it in the house. It's probably one of those top 10 healthiest things you could eat. So uh, for breakfast, I'm taking ground flax, uh, also chia and hemp, uh, and I put it on top of berries, and that way I'm getting my anthocyanidins, I'm getting soluble fiber or mucilage, I'm getting loads of different antioxidants, some uh, anti-cancer. Uh, um, it's got the lignans in it as well, so it's like a magic meal. I highly recommend doing that. If you want the recipe, I can post that too. So lignans are found primarily in flax seeds. Still, you can also find them in sesame seeds as well. Uh, there are in other herbs like burdock, certain herbs, some of the adaptogenic herbs like Siberian ginseng will have some lignans. So they're found in lots of different things. Uh, flax is probably the easiest way to get it in your diet. Um, in addition, you may have heard of lignins. So you've got lignans with an A, and then you've got lignins. Lignins is found in wood, and it's a polymer uh, derived from phenylpropanoids in wood. So it's not the same thing. You, we can't break down lignins, uh, which provides structural support to, to trees and stuff. So... Um, don't eat wood, you won't be able to digest it and get the health benefits from the lignans if you're eating it, okay? Now what's interesting in flaxseed is the compound that's primarily in the flax is going to be this compound, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, SDG. And this is the lignin found in flax that exists as a glycoside. 
Now what happens is in your gut, your gut bacteria digests the sugars off and then it gets further metabolized to form the two mammalian lignans called enterodial and enterolactone. And the reason why they're called mammalian is that they don't exist in plants. They need to be uh, produced in your gut. But this SDG compound, which is found in plants, is kind of the prodrug that then uh, is metabolized and processed to give the two active forms, the enterodial and the enterolactone. And this is, these little compounds are going to have that phytoestrogenic effect. And they'll have um, uh, a little blood pressure as well. Lots of interesting things, okay? So presumably this SDG is not well absorbed into your body and it needs to be metabolized in your gut, okay? Now there are other herbs, for example, like burdock I mentioned briefly. It contains a really important, or important, uh, includes a, a lignin called, lignin called arctogenin. And burdock root was originally used for, uh, as a blood cleanser in herbal medicine. It's called an alternative and it's commonly used for skin conditions. Um, it also, because skin is influenced by hormones, it's no surprise that there's gonna be some phytoestrogenic effects and, and hormone modulating effects. It also appears that it has some benefits um, to help prevent osteoporosis, at least in animal studies. Who knows if it'll you know, be effective in humans, um, but it appears to be interesting there. And burdock was also used historically in uh, Eziac, which was a herbal formula uh, developed in Ontario, up in uh, uh, Bracebridge, Ontario, which allegedly has some health promoting benefits uh, and helps with cancer. And it has uh, burdock, uh, slippery elm, rhubarb root, and sheep sorrel in it. Um, there's been some research on it. I think there's probably not a lot of harm in doing it. There's some lots of controversy around it. Uh, I don't tend to recommend it, but I do like burdock. In Japanese cuisine, they use the root uh, burdock, uh, it's called gobo, as a food. And that's another way that it can be, you can uh, get some uh, dietary lignans in, okay? So drinking something like burdock tea, as a, or burdock tea would be um, health promoting, helps cleanse the skin, it's a digestive bitter, lots of good things associated with it. Uh, but appreciate burdock has these lignans, but it also has other compounds like sesquiterpene lactones that have that uh, bitter effect. It's a thistle. It's in the Asteraceae family, just like artichoke is, um, and um, some of the other thistles that are in that family, as well as things like um, uh, wormwoods, uh, which have these sesquiterpene lactones as well that are bitter. Okay. So. The next one we'll talk about are flavonolignans. So we've talked about uh, flavones and we've talked about lignans. What a flavonolignin is, is you basically take the flavone molecule and you stick a phenylpropanoid on it. So it's kind of like half lignin and half flavonoid. So flavonolignans, we've already just mentioned uh, in the first lecture, and it was the second lecture, where the herb barberry contains the antimicrobial berberine, which is an isoquinoline alkaloid. We'll talk about that at the end of the lecture. Um, and it also contains a compound called 5-MHC, which is the flavonolignin. And this compound does not have any antimicrobial effects, but it appears to help with drug resistance against certain antibiotics and also against certain uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So it works by inhibiting these multidrug resistant pumps, they're sometimes referred to as P-glycoproteins. So that's one action that these guys have. Another effect it has is like any polyphenol, it's gonna have an antioxidant effect. Also, herbs that contain these flavonolignans include milk thistle, which is uh, well known as being probably the archetypal protective herb, okay? So milk thistle contains a flavonolignin. Um, silly marn is a mixture of flavonolignins, which includes silly benin, okay? And when you look at milk thistle, historically it's used for a number of different li liver conditions. Uh, it can help with cholesterol, it's good for heart disease, can help with diabetes. Um, and these compounds, the silly benin, for example, 
we know that it directly has that antioxidant effect, that hepatoprotective effect. And one of the ways it has a hepatoprotective effect is it increases some of the detox enzymes, um, uh, stimulates glutathione production, um, and a number of other mechanisms. Also, the silybenin in cancer studies has been shown to enhance the effects of radiation and decrease drug resistance. Uh, and so I think that's kind of neat where, in theory, taking antioxidants along with cancer drugs, uh, historically, oncologists would say, no, don't do that because it's going to reduce the effects of these uh, chemotherapeutic drugs. But in actual fact, it may enhance the effects. It may work synergistically synergistically and reduce some of the side effects. So it makes them work better and protects the liver and kidneys, which can be, if they become severely damaged, then people have to discontinue treatment, okay? Uh, so silymarin or silybenin uh, are flavonolignans. So is uh, the barberry uh, and presumably other some other herbs like Oregon grape will have them in as well. I suspect gold and seal will as well. Now these are a bunch of, I think most of these are test tube studies and maybe an animal study in there as well. Um, but I think this has potential, um, again, with chemotherapeutic drugs, we're all, we keep trying to develop new drugs because um, there's a certain point where drug resistance is going to exist. But maybe it's not just creating a new drug that works by a different mechanism, but combining drugs to have that synergistic effect. And so milk thistle, I wouldn't give it to everyone with cancer, but I would definitely want to look at the research and decide, okay, what does the research say? And even if it's not human trials, if someone's becoming re resistant to the um, cancer drugs after, let's say, the second or third uh, round, I would not hesitate to, to, uh, to use these along with them. Uh, another study on the last kind of random. Okay. Uh, Nada is asking, does the same apply to brown flax? Yeah, golden flax and brown flax are both great sources. Golden flax, I think, has higher amounts. That's what I've read somewhere. Um, we usually buy that, but I don't, I think they're both good. And Laura says that Korean. Sushi also uses burdock, very yummy and nutritious as well. Thank you. I did not know that. I've learned something new today. One of the last groups of compounds, I know there's, this is the last one, then another one after this. The next group we're going to talk about are the coumarins, franocoumarins, and phthalides. These are all uh, related compounds. They're not necessarily phenolic compounds, so, okay? They are uh, derived from phenolic compounds. But, and so I'm kind of putting them in this section, but they may not necessarily be uh, phenolic compounds, okay? And so they are made from phenylpropanoids, and basically, remember we are talking about sesquiterpene lactones or monoterpene lactones? When you take a phenylpropanoid lactone, you basically make a coumarin, franocoumarin, or a phthalide. So you start off with something like cinnamic acid or hydroxycinnamic acid, but in this case, you need to have uh, the side chain and this OH group almost side by side. And if you remember from chemistry, if you've done this, this OH group likes to join in here at this carboxylic acid to knock this other OH group off, and boom, you got this coumarin molecule, which is basically um, the uh, a lactone of cinnamic acid. So this one here, you've got more or less, you've got two aromatic rings instead of having two six-member carbon rings, you've got this OH group here, and then this ketone group, and that's your lactone. So this is the basic coumarin molecule. And then depending on where you add OHs, you can get different types of, uh, uh, different specific types of coumarins. You add a methyl group over here, that can always be added on later on. And then you've also got coumarins, which has this as the basic building block, but then you add this franal group to it. And then you have phthalides, which instead of having uh, the six-member carbon or uh, six-member ring with the OH in it, you have a five-member ring. Okay. So with coumarin, when someone cuts their grass and you smell that freshly cut 
grass smell, that those are the coumarins being released from the grasses. So coumarins are found, I would say they're ubiquitous. They're found throughout the plant, plant world. You, they're everywhere. And you'll find there's uh, a certain amount of coumarins in your diet. And I would say that they're not necessarily, I wouldn't call them phenolic. Definitely they're not polyphenolic compounds. Uh, they're coumarins. That's what they are. But they are a cousin of them. Now, medicinally, I don't really know the precise effects they have. They are going to be essential oils because you can smell them, right? That's what makes them. So you want to make note of that. They are essential oils because they're relatively small. You've got that uh, six member, six, nine, you've got nine carbons and two oxygens for the basic building blocks. That's pretty light compound and it's going to evaporate off, okay? So like a lot of the carminative herbs or herbs that are rich in essential oils, it'll have some antispasmodic effects. Uh, it can have a smooth muscle, uh, smooth muscle relaxant effect. So I find that a lot of the herbs that contain coumarins also often are used for uh, cramping of the smooth muscles, so menstrual conditions or cramping in the intestinal tract as well. Uh, they can also help sometimes dilate bronchioles. So coumarin, or sorry, red clover, um, in herbal medicine is actually often used for respiratory conditions. Now, just as an aside, red clover is a cousin of soy. It also contains isoflavones, and there are products on the market that are red clover products used or promoted for menstrual hot flashes, but they actually remove the coumarins from them, okay? Uh, one thing I'll say about, I'm going to jump ahead here, one thing about coumarins you have to be careful about is coumarin itself is actually hepatotoxic, and there are warnings on uh, FDA does not allow it as a food additive. And for example, Chinese cinnamon, some uh, forms of cinnamon have relatively high amounts of coumarin in it. And there have been warnings placed on uh, cinnamon uh, in some countries like Denmark, where they eat a lot of uh, cinnamon, that you have to watch it because it could affect your liver. Okay, we'll come back to that when we, in the second half of the term as well. Um, going back to the coumarins, other things that may have is a lot of the herbs will have a lymphatic effect. So because they act on smooth muscles, they may be acting on the lymphatic vessels in the body as well to help promote their movement, I guess. I don't know precisely how they work. And if you're working on lymphatics, you're going to help to reduce edema in the body. And edema is when you have swelling where the, uh, interstitial fluid, um, uh, increases and causes like ankle swelling. And puffiness, so it can help get rid of, get rid of that puffiness. And so herbs like horse chestnut um, is often used for edema. And again, as I mentioned, it helps to lower blood pressure, presumably by relaxing um, some of the uh, arteries. Okay. So red clover is one of the big ones. Cinnamon, uh, we got to watch out for. Also, herbs like cramp bark, which is used for menstrual cramps and also lowers blood pressure. Uh, and then horse chestnut which is often used for varicose veins, swelling edema, uh, hemorrhoids, and some other things. The other thing we gotta watch about is, coumarin itself is not a blood thinner, but sometimes it can be metabolized, uh, like if it's not harvested properly, and it sits around and gets goes a bit moldy, the molds and funguses can metabolize coumarin to make something called dicoumarin, which acts as a blood thinner, and has this anticoagulant effects. And so coumadin, which is rat poison, is, related to these coumarins, okay? So cinnamon's on the left, yellow clover, which is a cousin of red clover, it's used in herbal medicine, you don't even know this, but it's used in herbal medicine for lymphatic conditions and other things. Uh, it also is rich in coumarins. Um, now one thing, in cramp bark, it doesn't have as much coumarin in it, it has more of these umbellar umbellarferon and uh, scopoletin, which are two different types of coumarins that have OH groups and also an OH with a methyl group on it. These appear to be less toxic than coumarin alone. So for some reason, when you add an OH group, it seems to make it less toxic. So um, the concerns with taking cramp bark compared to like certain types of cinnamon uh, is probably less of an issue with this, okay? And I know people are going to ask me questions about cinnamon if I don't have one already. But so appreciate it. if you're only eating cinnamon once in a while, like Chinese cinnamon, 
uh, periodically, it's not an issue. It's like if you're eating high amounts, like if you're having like a cinnamon bun every day, or if you're taking cinnamon therapeutically for some condition, you might want to watch liver enzymes, okay? You don't have these additional coumarins, uh slides. Oh. Why not? How many of these slides are you missing? I'm just going to pop over here. I'll have a quick look and see what you're missing. Oops, shoot. Scrolling, scrolling, back up. Oh, how did that happen? I have no idea how that happened. Sometimes if, if this window was closed when I printed it, maybe that's what happened, I don't know. Um, is there... Oops, wait, I'm in the wrong section. Hold on. Slowly getting there. And occurrence, occurrence. Oh, you know, I don't even worry about those slides then, because they won't be on the exam. So don't worry about those, but thanks for mentioning that to me. It must have been, been uh, if I print something and it's just little arrows like that, I never do that deliberately, but it must have been turned down. But thanks for mentioning that. So you, you'll be okay. You don't need that. Because um, those are just pictures, okay? Uh, and there's for horse chestnut. Horse chestnut, one of the... Uh, here you've got, for example, a glyca side of one of these coumarins. Again, the sugar is attached to it, okay? So... Coumarins, they're essential oils. Uh, they have a lot of the same effects that you'll see with some of the essential oils, being carminatives, smooth muscle relaxants. Uh, some interesting little effects like being uh, working on edema may be uh, different for them than some of the other ones. Now, for furanyl coumarins, there's a couple very unique things that you'll see with these that you don't see with the coumarins, okay? Furanyl coumarins... Um, the main difference between them is you get this furan ring, and this is just like a little five-membered ring with an oxygen in it and some double bonds. When you add that in, it changes uh, properties with that. In particular, it'll affect uh, a number of things. One, what can happen is these furan coumarins, if they're exposed to sunlight, they'll, call, they'll absorb UV radiation and release uh, free radicals. And so furanocoumarins like sorlin are, uh, cause something called photodermatitis and it's a photosensitizer and it can actually, you can get severe sunburn from it. They do use things like sorlin topically for conditions like psoriasis, skin conditions, to help get rid of lesions, but it dramatically, uh, increases the risk of a sunburn and skin cancer. So you got to watch out. So that's one thing with them. The second thing is that you've probably heard of the grapefruit juice effect. What happens is these compounds are metabolized by the liver and they'll slow down phase one detox in the liver. Okay, so there's two main things, there's actually three, but there's two main uh, liver detox pathways. Phase one active, activates drugs and makes them more reactive. And then phase two uh, binds those reactive compounds to something else. So Grapefruit juice can slow down the detox or the elimination of certain medication, like cholesterol medications. And this could, the concern with this is it could cause them to hang around the body longer than, your, than you want or get to levels that are higher than desired. So it could have a negative effect, may have a positive effect as well. So those are two main things that you see with thoracoumarins in general. There's a third thing 
called aflatoxins. And what's interesting about aflatoxins is they're uh, a type of ranoclorin, but a little bit more complex. These grow, uh, there's a fungus called aspergillus that grows on grains and legumes and nuts and seeds uh, in tropical countries where you have a high humidity, really hot, warm weather. If peanuts are piled up and left to sit around for too long, um, I suspect that no matter what, no matter how you harvest it, like there's still going to be a certain amount of uh, these aflatoxins in them. And if you consume aflatoxins in, in high amounts, it can lead to liver cancer. These get activated by the liver and become reactive. And then I suspect that they just start damaging the liver. Now, we do test for the amount of aflatoxins in our diet here, but in places like the Philippines, for example, uh, these aflatoxins uh, are responsible for the rise in liver cancer in those countries. Now, if you've ever read the book called The China Study, which you should read, I think, in my opinion, um, you can get it on Amazon. It's like the research study was called the Amazon or the uh, China Study, but they've done other uh, research studies. And one of the things they did before doing the China Study is they looked at, in the Philippines, uh, the prevalence of liver cancer. And what they found was rich people uh, were getting more liver cancer compared to poor people even though they're being exposed to the same amount of aflatoxins. But what they found is when you eat a diet that has higher amounts of meat in it, the it seems to initiate the cancer. So the aflatoxin is the actual carcinogen, but you don't really get the uh, cancer being initiated unless you're consuming it with uh, meat in the diet. So the vegetarians weren't getting liver cancer, but the meat eaters were. And that seems to correspond, definitely meat in our diet increases the risk for uh, different types of cancer. Obviously, lots of people smoke and they don't get lung cancer, and lots of people eat meat and don't get cancer. But, uh, you know, if your risk is 2%, avoiding meat may lower it down below 1%. I don't know what the exact statistics are, but I wouldn't be, like, you know, terrified of eating meat. Uh, although for environmental reasons and ethical reasons and lots of other reasons we probably shouldn't be eating meat. Uh, but there may be some interesting connections to cancer there. And definitely with the aflatoxins, that's one of them, okay? So aflatoxins, the summary is bad for the liver. You get it in peanuts. Uh, now, other members of the APAC family, which are rich in uh, certain compounds like um, phthalides are in there, uh, some other things, it appears to reduce the toxicity associated with the aflatoxins. And it could be things like apigenin or it could be uh, thalides that we'll talk about shortly. So I don't know what it is, but it seems to maybe displace some of these toxins uh, so they're less damaging. Uh, and grapefruit juice, what's interesting is probably because it inhibits that phase one liver detox, it protects against the aflatoxin. I suspect the aflatoxin, when it becomes metabolized in the liver, just like how when Tylenol is metabolized by the liver, it becomes toxic if it's not eliminated quickly enough using phase two detox. So phase one makes it reactive, which makes it more water soluble and able to join to something. And then phase two, you stick something on to allow your body to excrete it. And so if you uh, have things like aflatoxin, uh, to reduce the toxicity, you slow down phase one of the liver, or you increase phase two, I suspect. Uh, that's one of the things. The final one we want to talk about are the phthalides. Um, these are a little bit like coumarin. They have that five-membered ring uh, attached to the uh, benzene ring there. It has that lactone group. I would say the similar, what I've seen with the phthalides is herbs that contain them appear to have a pretty significant smooth muscle relaxing effect. So like the coumarins, it relaxes smooth muscles. For example, celery, uh, consuming three stalks a day of celery dramatically lowers blood pressure. I can't remember if it's 10 or 12 points or whatever it is, millimeters uh, over a few week period, which is pretty dramatic. I don't think it's only the phthalides. It may also be associated with some of the flavonoids in there. It's also rich in apigenin, which has some positive effects on cardiovascular disease. But I'm guessing that it probably helps to lower blood pressure. I suspect that it also has some 
uh, smooth muscle relaxing effects and acts as an antispasmodic to release the cramping. I'm pretty sure it's going to be found in the essential oil because the size of it is not that big, relatively speaking. So um, if you look at the number of options and carbons on there, uh, what do we got? We've got 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 carbons. So it's about the same size as, as like a sesquiterpene lactone. Um, so I presumably it's going to be uh, found in the essential oils. Um, another important herb is one called uh, Dong Kwai, which is sometimes referred to as uh, female ginseng. Uh, it's not an adaptogen like ginseng is. But ginseng, like Korean ginseng, is a male tonic, sexual tonic, and Dong Kwai is considered a female tonic. And what it probably does is, it, because it contains this, these compounds that are fat, similar to what you find in celery, uh, it has a vasodilating effect and it helps to increase blood flow to the pelvic region. And maybe that's why it's, it has an antispasmodic effect, so it's great for menstrual cramps. It's not really a phytoestrogen per se, though, but it's great for menstrual cramps. Um, and they use it for men. Uh, as well uh, for its blood pressure lowering effects, which is kind of neat. Garden Angelica is uh, a type of uh, Angelica that grows in Europe, mostly Northern Europe and the Scandinavian countries. And it's used more for respiratory issues, but it does have similar compounds and can be used for female complaints as well. Uh, and what they found is that these phthalates help to improve outcomes with stroke uh, victims, which is kind of neat. So there you go. Someone had a question here, I had a comment. My neighbor had grapefruit juice with his Lipitor for 20 years, developed liver cancer, and sadly passed away two years ago. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, no, I, 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 that is unfortunate. The, the fact that he had the great produce with the Lipitor, it's hard, you know, because it's N equals one, if you had elevated uh, cholesterol, chances are he also ate a lot of meat. I'm just presumably he probably did. Um, you know, I no comment. Uh, so aflatoxins in the diet. So if you have aflatoxins in your diet and you eat meat, that dramatically increases your risk for cancer, yes. According to the guys who did the China study, which these are like world-class uh, researchers that aren't being funded by the meat, dairy, and egg industry, so I trust them far more than a lot of the other research out there. They're good people. So, the last group of phenolic-related compounds are not really phenolic compounds. They're actually a type of uh, ketones attached to benzene compound, uh, rings. These are called quinones, naphthoquinones, and anthroquinones, okay? Now, we've already talked about hydroquinone. So hydroquinone is a phenolic compound, but it readily donates and accepts uh, electrons to become benzoquinone that goes back and forth. So um, benzoquinone is the oxidized version of hydroquinone, okay? And they just could swap, donate, and accept electrons. And this can be good or bad, depending on the situation. In general, if it's generating free radicals, it's going to act as an antimicrobial, but also increases the risk of cancer. The different naphthoquinones, uh, we'll talk about in a second. So here we go. The arbutin makes your hydroquinone, and then it can, or hydroquinone, which can actually uh, go back and forth to make the benzoquinone, okay? Now, naphthoquinones, are in the middle here. The difference with these guys is you've got that basic quinone structure with a benzene ring attached to it. And naphthoquinones are found in our bodies. Uh, everyone has them in their bodies, and the main source is going to be vitamin K and coenzyme Q10. Now, coenzyme Q10 is one of the main compounds used in the electron transport chain in our mitochondria because it readily accepts and donates electrons safely. And uh, by doing that, you create energy in the body. Now, if you uncouple the electron transport chain, you can uh, cause the release of free radicals that can damage the mitochondria and lead to apoptosis and death. 
And so presumably, naphthequinone molecules, um, some of the effects it could have is by interfering with the electron transport chain in, the, in our mitochondria and in the mitochondria microorganisms. And so naphthoquinones in general, I would say, have an antimicrobial effect. So black walnut, there's another herb called podarco, which grows down in Mexico and Central America. Um, it's, the bark is used historically as an antimicrobial and also as an anti-cancer agent. Um, some of these guys are used to kill worms. That's why they're called a vermifuge, as a term means it kills worms. Uh, you won't even know that on the exam, but that's just not for the midterm. Another thing with these is naphthoquinone compounds tend to be kind of red, brownie in color. If you've ever seen henna, which is often used in, uh, I would say, Middle Eastern and South Asian culture uh, as a hair for the dye, because it makes the hair look kind of red. Uh, also, as like a temporary tattoo on the hands for weddings, uh, that is, they're using henna. So henna is used as a natural pigment to get that red-brown color. But in addition, henna can also be used as an antifungal and antimicrobial topically and internally as well in those cultures in Ayurvedic medicine. As I mentioned, it's an antioxidant, but it's also a pro-oxidant. And it appears to have a bit of a mild laxative effect, not as much as the next group of compounds we're going to talk about, which are the anthroquinones, okay? So here's black walnut on the left, and that's what some of the uh, uh, seed husks look like. And both the leaves and these seed husks are used as antimicrobials. Uh, this is at my parents' place on the left-hand side. One of the things that they have to do every few years is cut back along the edge of their vegetable garden because their vegetable garden's just on the border of the roots of the black walnut tree. And if the black walnut roots get into the garden, it starts to kill off uh, some of the herbaceous plants in there because black walnut naturally produces these naphthoquinones to fight off insects and also to uh, outcompete other, uh, other types of plants. So certain plants will basically die when exposed to the naphthoquinone, the jubilone, which is in black walnut. So people often will have troubles with growing certain things. Uh, grass doesn't seem to be affected, but uh, other things are, other plants are. Uh, when I was a kid, I was told that the smell of fresh cut grass was toxic to inhale. I'm assuming this is false. Uh, well, I mean, if fresh cut grass contains high amounts of coumarins, then I would say inhaling a lot of it would probably be bad for you. Uh, I doubt, you know, if, I doubt small amounts are going to cause any harm. Everything is dose dependent. But yeah, I mean, if you concentrated that and inhaled it, the coumarins in it are toxic. That's probably what, where that came from. But I, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. Uh, small amounts won't hurt you. So anthroquinones are the last group. These are like the naphthoquinones, but you've got the benzene ring on each side of that quinone molecule. And the when I hear anthroquinone uh, or anthroquinone glycosides, the first thing that pops into my head is stimulating laxatives. Okay? They make you defecate. They basically increase bowel movements. Okay? So herbs like senna or drugs or natural drugs like senna-cot, you can buy pretty much any drugstore or health food store. They contain what are called senocides. And these senocides are glycosides of the anthroquinones. And these compounds, basically, when you take them, they move all the way to your large intestine. They get metabolized, or they, the sugars get eaten off by the gut bacteria, liberates these compounds. They increase peristalsis, increase the influx of water and the lumen of the bowel, and generally stimulate a bowel movement within it probably about around seven or eight hours, okay? So Senna is the main, I would say, archetypal, classic, stimulating laxative, and is one of the most commonly used drugs historically for constipation, okay? Uh, drug companies are using other types of things now, but it, it definitely is, is one of the things. I don't use it a lot, it's not my go-to, but it can be used. Rhubarb root and aloe resin, not the gel, but the resin of the aloe vera plant, also contain uh, anthroquinone glycosides. And all three of those are used in herbal medicine 
as either a gentle or a strong laxative. There's also things like cascara, uh, another tree that grows in North America that can be used as a stimulating laxative. Uh, you don't need to know names of every single one of these, but know that senna and that herbs containing anthraquinone glycoside cause uh, are, are uh, stimulating laxatives. Um, there are a few safety concerns with taking anthraquinone glycoside. We'll talk about them later on, probably, I'm sure. But they do affect your electrolytes if you take a lot of them. So if you had a heart condition, you're taking certain medications, it could affect your potassium levels, and that could be problematic. The other anthraquinone glycoside containing herb that I can think of is St. John's wort. Now, both Senna and St. John's wort, the compounds in it have this red, yellowy color to it. So when you're consuming them, they can change the color of your urine um, if you're taking high enough. St. John's wort is a classic antidepressant. The, the main compound in St. John's wort uh, the antidepressant effects is not associated with the anthraquinone. The anthraquinone is more of an antiviral and antimicrobial uh, phytochemical. Not, it doesn't have any, any laxative effect, okay? And it doesn't have any antidepressant effect or minimal, okay? So the benefits of St. John's work is one, as an antidepressant, but two, also as a vulnerary and antimicrobial. And so you're getting that antimicrobial properties from the anthraquinone. Okay, let me check the time. Uh, it's 10.23. Let's take a break till 10.30, and then I'll start the alkaloids. Okay? If you have any questions, leave them here. I'll be back in a sec.
Okay, can you guys hear me, see me? Any questions? Do we need to memorize common names only? Yes. For the midterm, yes. You do not need to know Chincona official officialis, glycine max, any of those things for the midterm. Okay, only common names for midterm. For the final, I will give you a list of uh, the herbs that we cover in the GI section, you need to know both common and scientific name for them, but there's only a handful of those. And so we might talk about, I don't know, 100 different plants, but you only need to know it for um, certain ones, okay? I'm gonna get started. Okay, so the last two sections we're going to talk about most of the alkaloids and then uh, another um, couple slides on uh, sulfur containing compounds. But alkaloids, what makes them different than anything we've talked about so far is they contain a nitrogen. And that's what makes alkaloids an alkaloid. Okay, so there are different types of alkaloids based on the ring structure those nitrogens are associated with. So the pure definition of an alkaloid is it has to be within a ring structure. Uh, some of them have a single ring. Some of them have multiple rings. Um, there are protoalkaloids, which don't actually have the nitrogen within a ring and are in this category as well. For the exam purpose, I'm not going to ask you, a, I would not, I want to emphasize, I would not ask you the following. Uh, you know, which of the following alkaloids has a five-membered ring with two oxygens attached and uh, two aromatic bonds? I would never ask you that. Um, you need to know that alkaloids in general contain a nitrogen. And I would want you to know that, uh, let's say, certain properties or certain, uh, maybe a, a very common herb or food contains it, like coffee contains purine, uh, golden seal, which or barberry, which we've mentioned several times, contains isoquinoline alkaloids and they act as antimicrobials. Uh, but I'm not going to ask you how many carbons or anything else. All you need to know about alkaloids is they have nitrogen from a structural standpoint, okay? Now, one of the things about alkaloids that makes them unique from uh, other compounds is the nitrogen, okay? Now, if you think about your body, proteins have a lot of nitrogens in it, but also all the neurotransmitters in your body, at least most, a lot of the neurotransmitters in your body, uh, I'm trying to think of an exception, um, they contain nitrogens. And so it's not surprising that some of these alkaloids or most of these alkaloids can have the potential to interact with your nervous system. And that's why alkaloids in general can be really, really potent and potentially dangerous substances. You know, it can range from being pretty mild, like caffeine, which isn't that dangerous. I mean, you could die if you overdose from caffeine, uh, but I think you'd have to have a pretty high dose, uh, to other things like opioids, uh, which could cause you to die, or uh, substances that cause hallucinations, or substances that uh, cause paralysis, okay, or things that stimulate digestion through uh, one wing of the, of the nervous system or suppress it through enough through the same way. Okay. So in general, um, alkaloids interact with the nervous system and they can be very potentially powerful drugs and also dangerous. Uh, a quick little review of the nervous system. I'm not going to go into this too much. You basically have your one nerves that nerve conduction is when you have an electrical charge goes down it and when um, you basically have inhibitory and excitatory nerves that stimulate or suppress that nerve, when it reaches a certain threshold uh, with a certain number of positive ions that are flowing into it, that causes depolarization that then causes these little vesicles to migrate to the edge of the nerve. 
spilling out neurotransmitters that then bind to receptors to have an effect. After the neurotransmitters bind, it then gets reabsorbed by certain transporters attached to the nerve, and then it gets stored again. It gets stored in, the, in these vesicles here so that they can be preserved. What happens is neurotransmitters that are floating around freely are either broken down by enzymes like the monoamine oxidase enzyme, or there are other ones like catecholomethyltransferase and cholinesterase enzymes that are responsible for degrading neurotransmitters. So if you don't degrade them, then obviously they're going to be around, they're going to keep stimulating things. So the nervous system is a fine balance between things being released, things being absorbed, things being uh, broken down, things being created, uh, nerves being inhibited, slowed down, other ones speeding it up. And all these different places that we've talked about are potential targets for drugs and also herbs, okay? And so a lot of the herbs that we're going to talk about affect different pathways on here. Now, you have the central nervous system, and then you have the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system uh, is responsible for fight or flight. That's kind of like when you run away from a bear and your pupils dilate, uh, your muscles get more blood flow, your digestion gets shut down, your mouth dries up. Um, that's all kind of associated with things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. And so those are the main neurotransmitters that bind to the adrenergic receptors in your body. Okay, and you've got alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. Some affect blood vessels, some affect arteries, some affect uh, your lungs, some affect your secretory organs. Um, so that's your adrenergic receptors. Your mu muscarinic receptors are associated with the parasympathetic nervous system. So when you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, you increase digestive function in general. So you'll cause a release of stomach acid, pancreatic enzymes, you'll increase motility of the bowels. Uh, because you're in a non-stressed out state, you don't need to have your heart pumping too quickly or your, or your uh, oxygen exchange to be optimal. So uh, bronchioles will constrict, your heart will slow down, your pupils, which are dilated, they'll let in a lot of light when you're stressed, will constrict so you can focus and read a book. So the classic couch potato, um, sitting on the couch watching TV or reading a book involves a very sympathetic nervous system, and then running away from a bear involves a sympathetic nervous system. You guys already know this. The final uh, uh, nervous system we'll talk about here is the somatic nervous system, and this involves your muscles. And so muscle contraction involves nicotinic receptors that when you, uh, the, nic or the acetylcholine molecule uh, will cause muscle contractions. In addition, acetylcholine is also an important neurotransmitter at the synaptic ganglion. And so you've got nicotinic receptors in the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the somatic nervous system. And it stimulates all three of those systems, okay? So in the case of... Uh, the sympathetic nervous system, nicotinic receptors are only involved with the synaptic ganglion, while the parasympathetic nervous system, it involves the synaptic ganglion and the muscarinic receptors. And finally, with the somatic nervous system, it involves only the nicotinic receptors on the actual muscle itself. Okay? That's like a quick little summary there. You don't need to know that really for the exam, for my exam. You learn it in physiology world, whatever else. Now, Canical amines are worth mentioning. Okay, we've already talked about these briefly. Canical amines are a type of phenolic compound that have this canical group. You've got the two OH groups on a benzene ring side by side. Okay, so here you've got norepinephrine and epinephrine. What makes these different than the phenylpropanoids we talked about is that they have a nitrogen or an amine group attached to it. And that dramatically changes the effects of these. So. If you remove this amine group, this compound would have minimal effect on the adrenergic receptors in the body. But with that presence of that uh, little amine group, it has uh, a very strong stimulating effect, okay? Uh, if you take a shot of adrenaline, all these functions, pupil dilation, bronchodilation, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, uh, digestion and urine goes down, sweating goes up, alertness, 
lots of different things. And so there are lots of different conditions that by stimulating adrenergic receptors in the central nervous system or uh, stimulating or blocking it in the uh, peripheral nervous system can have an effect on things like uh, mood, attention deficit disorder. Uh, you might block these to lower blood pressure and heart rate, or you may increase it to increase blood pressure or heart rate. Depending on if someone's in shock, you want to stimulate it. If someone's got heart disease, you may want to slow it down. Uh, if someone can't breathe, you may want to give them something that binds to the, binds to the adrenergic receptors, the beta receptors in the uh, respiratory tract to cause dilation. Also with uh, urination, and men who have enlarged prostates, these are sometimes the target to increase uh, urine output. Okay, so these are all the different things that epinephrine and norepinephrine affect. Focus, concentration, mood, thermogenesis, bronchodilation, cardiac output, circulation, uh, but also urine, that's why it's yellow, and your digestion tract, it uh, diverts blood away from your digestive tract and puts it more towards muscles, okay? Now, dopamine... Uh, in addition to uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, you've got dopamine. And dopamine, is a, it does have some of those stimulating properties, but it's also involved with reward mechanism in the body and concentration. So people who uh, do cocaine or smoke or like to gamble or get addicted to pornography or even uh, are sugar addicts, it's all related to dopamine. Dopamine makes you feel good. Even when you drink coffee, you get a nice little dopamine glow out of it. That makes you go, oh, that feels so good. Not quite as good as a little bump from cocaine, but uh, definitely it's in that same category as feeling good. Um, so in small amounts, like having a cup of coffee, it's good for you. In high amounts, dopamine release can be very devastating. It can cause severe addictions. So when people do crack, they're hooked on that stuff for life. It's very difficult to get rid of it. Um, also, it can in high amounts, it can cause uh, psychotic episodes, hallucinations. Uh, it can affect hormones as well. So dopamine tends to suppress prolactin levels, uh, which is involved with uh, regulating various hormones in the body. Um, it also, dopamine has, uh, is a sexual stimulant in men. And uh, so when men ejaculate and lose the ability to have an erection, it's related to the fact that prolactin levels go up and suppress the dopamine levels in the body, okay? So conditions that involve dopamine are related to attention deficit, schizophrenia, psychosis, you want to suppress the dopamine, Parkinson's, you want to increase dopamine, drug and alcohol dependence, you want to modulate it. Uh, if you like, uh, dopamine is also involved with uh, digestive function to some degree. So certain antiemetic drugs that are used for nausea and vomiting and motion sickness will target dopamine receptors and also hormonal imbalances. So again, you don't need to know all this specifically, but this is a little, I drew this, I used to teach the nervous system for component of um, pharmacology before I had kids. And uh, that's where all these slides are from. And it kind of goes nicely with the herbal stuff. So I'm including it in here as a nice review review for you guys, okay? So these are all the things that dopamine does. Makes you hallucinate, makes you vomit, improves focus, makes you feel good. Uh, too much dopamine gets your arms jumping all about. Uh, so people who are like high on certain drugs, you'll find that they're jittery and kind of got shakes and stuff. Uh, insufficient, instead of having large jerking movements, it'll just cause a resting tremor. And that's what happens with Parkinson's. And also you get um, elevation of um, dopamine will ca cause uh, prolactin levels to raise. So dopamine will suppress prolactin, which is involved with breastfeeding. So th certain herbs involved with fertility will modulate prolactin levels, actually, and dopamine levels. Uh, another thing with the ner nervous system that's worth mentioning is that neurotransmitters are inhibited by a number of enzymes. There's an enzyme called catechol-O-methyltransferase enzyme. This targets only the catechol-amines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, okay? And it adds a methyl group. Once you stick a methyl group onto this OH group, it no longer has the same effect. You can't bind to the adrenergic receptors or the dopamine receptors in the same way. So that's one way you can 
inhibit epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. The other way is if you cleave off that nitrogen, uh, and that uses vitamin B6 as a, as a uh, cofactor, uh, once you remove it, it greatly diminishes, if not eliminates all effects it will have on those receptors, okay? So in order for these catecholamines to bind to the adrenergic or dopamine receptors, it needs to have those catechol groups available, the OH groups available, with nothing attached to it, and it needs to have that amine present. Otherwise, it's going to have a very diminished effect. Uh, I would say that herbs that have that catechol, catechol group without the amine are probably going to have a, more of a modulating effect and maybe a, a slightly inhibiting effect on those, uh, or it could be modulating as well, but not a strong stimulating effect. So when I think of, for example, the herb Vitex, um, it appears to modulate dopamine receptors because it has a flavonoid with a catechol amine or catechol group, but not, not doesn't have the amine group. Okay. So the monoamine enzyme doesn't target only the catechol amines, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, but it also works on serotonin, uh, dimethyltryptophan, uh, which we talked about with the ayahuasca, uh, certain compounds like tyramine, which is in your diet, and also melatonin. So the catechol O-methyltransferase enzyme only targets dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, while the monoamine oxidase enzyme we just talked about targets a lot more, okay? So that's just a quick little review for you. Protoalkaloids, these are phenethylamines, okay? These are like the phenylpropanoids we talked about, but instead of uh, having an OH group or a carboxylic acid group on the end here, you got an amine group. And by adding an amine group, it's now going to have a potential to interact with, I would say, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, uh, maybe serotonin to a lesser degree. But most of these guys have some uh, modulating or a stimulating effect, or actually more stimulating effect on uh, the catechol amines, okay? So some examples of these compounds is you've heard of ephedra, the herb. Ephedrine or pseudoephedrine is a stimulating compound um, that works on the sympathetic nervous system. And senefrin is another cousin. You go. A couple, uh, mescaline is a hallucinogen. Uh, from peyote, it has this basic structure. And then tyramine, which is a, a byproduct of uh, fermentation of tyrosine, which is found in meats and cheeses, uh, it also has a stimulating effect on uh, epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine receptors. So most of these compounds here uh, will potentiate the action of some of the catecholamines, okay? So here's your catecholamines on the left, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine. Here is synephrine and ephedrine. You can see their structures are very similar. Both of these stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, kind of both directly and indirectly. And then mescaline will modulate this dopamine receptor and have effects uh, related to dopamine more so. And how are these guys made? Phenylalanine, the amino acid, just like when we're making the uh, phenylpropanoids, you've got phenylalanine and tyrosine. They can be used to make things like cumeric acid, or if you leave that nitrogen on, you make ephedrine, tyramine, or synephrine from either the phenylalanine or the tyrosine. Okay? You don't need to know that per se, but it's important to remember the OH groups. And what if you look at this, the difference between tyramine, synephrine, and ephedrine is although they all affect epinephrine and norepinephrine and dopamine receptors to varying degrees, they don't have the catechol group to it, okay? So with ephedrine, we talked about this in the first lecture. Uh, the uh, Neanderthals, there was that one Neanderthal man who was found carrying a pouch containing ephedrine in it. We know that the ancient Egyptians used the ephedrine or the ephedra herb as a, uh, as a prelim or an early uh, puffer for as asthma. And so, Ephedrine, one of the main things that it does is it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and it's called a sympathomimetic. It mimics the sympathetic nervous system. So I may ask on the herb, which of the following herbs or groups of compounds 
act as sympathomimetics. And in this case, I would say ephedrine is fair game or ephedra the herb is also fair game, okay? I don't ask always to go with that specific, but in this case, I'd say it's fair game. So ephedrine is known to, it increases metabolism, so it's been used for weight loss, uh, but you can cause some, uh, uh, some deaths sometimes <laughs> that you have to watch out for. It bron uh, dilates the bronchioles and dries up nasal passageways, and that's why it's used in cold, flu, and sinus medications, and sometimes for asthma. Uh, and it's a stimulant. Um, which is usually a side effect, not necessarily a benefit from it. So in herbal medicine, ephedra is used primarily uh, for respiratory tract infections and allergies. And that's the main thing. And it may be combined with other herbs to mitigate or decrease the side effects so it's not as stimulating. Um, ephedra doesn't necessarily, its main action isn't directly binding to the adrenergic receptors, but indirectly it seems to cause a release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, it does have some effect on dopamine as well. So people who are taking ephedra as like a stimulant or for weight loss can find that they get a little bit, bit addicted to it, just like you can become addicted to smoking or cocaine. Not to the same degree, but to some degree, it does have an addictive property to it because of that dopamine effect. Now, if you look at the top here, here's norepinephrine. So when you take an injection of norepinephrine or your body releases it, you get this really fast peak that goes up and then it comes down very, very fast because it's inactivated by both the monoamine oxidase and the catabolic methyltransferase enzyme. Ephedrine from ephedra, the herb, when you take it orally, it's slower to be absorbed. And the other thing that happens is... Um, it doesn't reach the same peak because it's not directly binding to the adrenergic receptors to the same degree, maybe a little bit, but not that much. Um, and it's not inactivated by the methyltransferase enzyme, only the monoamine oxidase enzyme. So what that means is, unlike a shot of adrenaline, which is super intense and only lasts for a couple minutes or a few minutes, ephedrine has a slower amplitude to its intensity and it's much more longer acting. So it might last for let's say four to six hours compared to four to six minutes or two to three minutes, however long it is, okay? So that's just one way that, you know, it's exerting a similar action, but, you know, there's a big, big difference between that, okay? Now, cinephrine is a compound found in bitter orange. Bitter orange is used to make marmalade, okay? Um, so it's used in Chinese medicine as, in, as a herb, um, but also in uh, Seville oranges in Spain traditionally are used to make marmalade. There is small amounts of cinephrine in marmalade and even in some orange juices. Um, when you're using bitter orange in herbal medicine, not only do you have the cinephrine in it, but there are other bitter compounds that act on the digestive effect, and there's also some essential oils and flavonoids. So cinephrine is not the only compound when you're using it as a whole herb when they're when the actual rind is used, but it is in there. And like ephedrine, cinephrine um, is essentially could be used interchangeably as far as I'm concerned. It's used for, um, uh, it could be used for sinus conditions and weight loss. Uh, some Chinese formulas will have weight loss and it's been marketed as a weight loss product. Probably is a little bit safer than ephedra, but I still would be you know, cautious. I don't ever recommend these things for people for weight loss um, because if you're weighing 300 pounds and you take something that's a sympathomimetic, you raise blood pressure and increase heart rate, those are probably already an issue that you're trying to come back in uh, people who weigh 300 pounds. So you got to focus on diet and exercise. That's what you need to be encouraging, not taking some magic pill to burn calories. Yes, they work. I mean, if someone was getting married and they had two months to drop, you know, 10 pounds and, and they kind of plateaued uh, and they're looking for, you know, a little bit of help. Probably is not the end of the world, but a healthy person, you're just trying to like look their best for that day. I know it's vain, but I mean, I wouldn't judge, but, um, but it does come with certain risks. Okay. And it's also illegal to market it as a weight loss product in Canada and the, in the U S because there has been, um, uh, 
deaths associated with it. Probably like, they're taking a bunch of caffeine and taking this, and they're already overweight with high cholesterol, high blood pressure. Uh, but it can sometimes even happen to young, healthy people, relatively speaking. Now, another uh, proto-alkaloid, which is not really used in herbal medicine for anything, but it's worth mentioning, is tyramine. And as I mentioned earlier, it's basically produced uh, during the fermentation pro process. So certain uh, yeasts and bacteria will take certain amino acids and metabolize them to produce tyramine. And it's derived from tyrosine. And tyramine is neurologically active. And so if you're eating, if you're drinking wine and eating cured meats and uh, chocolate, which sounds like some of my favorite things, you uh, are ingesting a sympathomimetic that luckily, luckily for us, uh, it's an inactivated in our intestinal tract. So the monoamine, en monoamine oxidase enzyme lines our guts and helps prevent us from basically uh, absorbing all this tyramine because if you were to have a big meal of wine and cheeses and chocolate and avocado and all these things, uh, and we didn't have that enzyme, chances are you get increased heart rate, uh, you get heart palpitation, blood pressure goes up, and it could precipitate a hypertensive crisis. And so for certain people who are on monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are drugs that block that monoamine oxidase enzyme, um, they have to watch what they eat. They have to go on a very specific diet to minimize the amount of tyramine they're consuming, okay? Otherwise, they can get into, basically, it's like taking uh, ephedrine or, or uh, in high amounts. Now, mescaline, which is something I've never actually tried before, it's a compound that's found in two types of cactuses, the peyote cactus, which grows in Mex Mexico, and San Pedro cactus, which grows in Peru. Both were employed by shamans in those two respective countries. And mescaline, um, it works by binding to both serotonin receptors and also to uh, certain dopaminergic receptors. And it tends to have a very strong stimulating effect, a little bit different than ayahuasca because it involves more of some of those adrenergic receptors. Um, and it's used for vision quests by people in those cultures. Uh, here is a picture in Peru of a marketplace where they're selling freshly cut San Pedro cactus. Uh, oops, oops. Uh, and on the left hand side there, there is a picture of Hueco yarn art. And this is the classic art that's created by people who've had vision quests uh, by being on peyote. And you can see in the center here, that represents the peyote and the deer and the traveling on the boat. This is all part of the journey that these people have had that have gone, that they've gone on that's inspired you know, spiritual growth and, and has had a therapeutic effect. So it's neat. So some of the visions that people will see uh, are not unlike the artwork that they've depicted here, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> so we've talked about things that directly or indirectly will affect uh, either bind to the adrenergic or dopaminergic receptors or cause a release of um, epinephrine or epinephrine and dopamine. Now, another group of compounds that have an effect on the sympathetic nervous system are the purines alkaloids. Now, another term for purine alkaloids that I would say most researchers call are methylxanthines, okay? So the purine structure is displayed on the left, I'm sure that probably everyone out there has had caffeine or theobromine before. And these are found in things like coffee and tea. And they, as you probably know, coffee is a bit sti pardon me, stimulating. Chocolate to a lesser degree. Uh, I don't find coffee does, or chocolate has a huge stimulating effect on me, but it does. Certainly I wouldn't give it to the kids right before bed. Uh, otherwise, they won't be going to sleep right away. Uh, and tea to another degree. And so these guys will have an effect on the sympathetic nervous system in an indirect way. And so there's a nice picture of coffee I took down in, I think, Costa Rica. And the way that um, epinephrine and norepinephrine exerts her effect is 
they bind to adrenergic receptors in the body. And when it binds to an adrenergic receptor, it releases that G protein, which binds to another protein called adenyl cyclase, which is an enzyme that converts ATP, which is a breakdown product of carbohydrates, into cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP is called uh, an intracellular messenger, okay? And so this little cyclic AMP is the thing that tells all these other little enzymes in the body uh, inside the cell to do whatever they're supposed to do. And that may be relax smooth muscles or increase the force of contraction of that muscle, uh, break down fats or starch. Um, and then what happens is after a period of time, this there's another enzyme called phosphodiesterase that basically takes the cyclic AMP and cleaves it apart and inactivates it, okay? So the epinephrine causes the release of the cyclic AMP that has the effect within the cell, okay? So what coffee does is coffee doesn't directly bind. So the caffeine doesn't directly bind, or the purine alkaloid doesn't directly bind to the adrenergic receptor. Rather, it binds to this phosphodiesterase enzyme. And by doing that, it inhibits the breakdown of the cyclic AMP. So your body is always releasing some epinephrine and norepinephrine is just floating around and, and having a, a slight stimulating effect. And then in the presence of the caffeine, it just potentiates it. It makes it work even better. Okay. So that's how coffee works. I think that's just kind of neat. So on exam question, I could ask caffeine. I could ask a question like, um, methylxanthines is another term for purine alkaloids. I could ask a question where I say, uh, which of the following is, uh, which of the following compounds is classified as a methylxanthine or a purine alkaloid, A, caffeine, B, uh, berberine, et cetera. Or I could ask a question, caffeine has a sympathomimetic effect through the following mechanism. A, it binds to adrenergic receptors, false. B, it binds to the phosphodiesterase enzyme, which is true. C, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So I might ask you that on the question, on exam. Uh, someone's asked me, why would someone be on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor? Um, they're one of the first types of antidepressants that were on the market. They don't use them very much. They can be used for certain mood stuff, rarely. It can also be used for uh, some conditions like Parkinson's. Uh, those are the two things that jumped to mind. Uh, but some, yeah, there's just some neurological things. Uh, someone's asking, could you just eat, going back to San Pedro's cactus, can you just eat that and have the effect? You, you got to eat a whole bunch of San Pedro's cactus. Like you probably have to eat, I would say, I don't know, I've never done it, but you do four or five rows of that to have the effect. Uh, you boil it up and then drink it or eat them raw, but you got to eat quite a bit of it. Uh, and it usually causes uh, vomiting after a period of time, and then you have the hallucinations after that. Um, I'm not encouraging that, just so we're clear. But if you want to do that, I don't know, you'd want to do some research on that. Um, so what's interesting here is if you look at the structure of ATP, so ATP gets converted to cyclic AMP, and that's your intracellular messenger, What's kind of neat is the fact that caffeine actually looks a lot like cyclic AMP or ATP. So the adenosine is very similar to the methylxanthines. Okay? So we talked about the sympathetic nervous system. Now I want to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you remember, this is responsible for causing the couch potato effect, okay? Relaxation. When you're relaxed and you're not running away from bears, you want to focus more on digestion, on uh, being able to focus and read the book or watch TV so the pupils constrict so you can read better. Uh, it slows down the heart rate. Uh, you might be watching some you know, really cheesy romance on uh, Netflix so you start to cry. 
uh, or maybe it's a horror movie and you start to sweat. Although sweating actually affects, can be affected by both. Um, salivation, bile. So basically, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for releasing fluids in general. Urine, sweat, tears, saliva, bile, all of those, okay? And like I mentioned before, it involves acetylcholine binding to the uh, synaptic ganglia, the nicotinic receptors, and the muscarinic receptors. So, a lot of the herbs in the, a lot of this, the herbs in this section, you don't use these in practice. I mean, coffee I use every single day, but most of these things you'll never use in practice or come across it, but it's interesting. So it's somewhat useless, but I think it's helpful to understand pharmacology and herbal medicine and medicine in general, okay? Your mucus, muscarinic receptors, they got their name from the fly agaric mushroom called Amanita muscaria, and it was used as fly poison in the past. Now, this mushroom, uh, historically, you've probably seen it. This is the variety that grow, grows around here. Uh, the variety that grows in Ontario is yellow with white spots on top. The infamous toadstool mushroom that you can see in like Alice in Wonderland where you've got the red cap with the white spots, you know, associated with kind of fairies and, and magic and all sorts of things. That's also the fly agar. It's just a different color, but same genus and species. And both contain uh, a compound called muscarine. And muscarine is the compound that binds to the acetylcho acetylcholine receptors called the muscarinic receptors. It was given the name from this herb. And so when you take muscarine, which is found in the fly agar, it'll cause a stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Oh no, I'll talk about that. So, there's a couple ways you can stimulate those muscarinic receptors. The fly agaric mushroom is one, and this is a tertiary amine or amide. It's not actually um, technically a, 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 an alkaloid, but we're going to talk about the alkaloid in a second. Now, acetylcholine is inactivated by something called cholinesterase or acetylcholinesterase. And that inactivates it. So to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, you use something like muscarine, acetylcholine, or another alkaloid we're going to talk about in a second. And to inhibit it, uses this enzyme. Now, imidazole alkaloids, there's only really one that I know of, and that's called, and that comes from a plant called Jabirandi or pilocarpus. And there's a few different species of this. And it makes pilocarpine. Pilocarpine was used in pharmacology. I've never actually seen it, a patient ever on it. This is the classic uh, parasympathomimetic. That means that a substance that mimics the parasympathetic nervous system. And when you're learning about this in pharmacology next year, substances that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system will often produce the side effects called sludge. Salivation, which you know what that is, lacrimation, so uh, tearing, urination, defecation, GI upset, and emesis. So here's a little drawing. This is how sometimes I'll draw things to remember things rather than write down notes. So here we've got the muscarinic, the fly agaric mushroom on the left hand side, and here we've got pilocarpine. Carp is like a fish. And they're both, you're seeing all their fluids are being released. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, urination, defecation, you know, tears, you name it. They're just purging everything. So I will probably could ask you on the exam. Pilocarpine is known to act as a A, parasympath parasympathomimetic, B, sympathomimetic, C, whatever it would be. Uh, or I could ask, say, imidazole alkaloids sometimes found in pilocarpus are known to produce the following symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, lacrimation, defecation. Yeah, I could ask a couple questions like that. Another type of compounds are called pyroloindoalkaloids, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, there's only one that I really think of with this, and that's physostigmine. And physostigmine is also a parasympathomimetic. Now, it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, producing the same symptoms that the muscarinic uh, 
agonist cause, so things like um, muscarine or pilocarpine, but it does that not by binding to the muscarinic receptors, but by inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine. And so it acts as an, a cholinesterase inhibitor. So you may have heard of uh, probably at least 15 years or 10 years ago, there was a, uh, in the subways in Japan, there was people were, uh, some terrorist group released sarin gas. And sarin gas is uh, an organic pesticide, basically, uh, what's it called, an um, organophosphate insecticide. And the way that it works as a poison is the same way that phytostigmine works, and it comes from the calorimine, is that it basically causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So nerve gas poisoning that often occurs associated with wars, which are generally, their use is discouraged, um, are caused by things that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. And you basically die by, uh, uh, I would say it's by through respiratory collapse or shock. You basically vomit, you defecate, you sweat, cry, you know, you basically purge all the fluids out of your body and your blood pressure drops and your heart stops working. Uh, very unpleasant way to go because you're basically dehydrated because you've lost all your bodily fluids. Uh, and we'll talk about the antidote for this in a second, which is another alkaloid. So, both physostigmine and pilocarpine are alkaloids that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. One does it directly, the pilocarpine does it directly by binding to the muscarinic receptors, and the physostigmine does it indirectly by inhibiting the enzyme responsible for the breakdown. Okay? So acetylcholine is, uh, binds to the, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, but in different places. Now we're going to talk about nicotine. Nicotine is an interesting molecule because it contains a pyridine and a pyrolilidine alkaloid. So it's got two alkaloids on it. And nicotine binds to nicotinic receptors. And you've got these in both the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, somatic and central nervous system, okay? And, you know, what would I ask for an exam? I don't know. I mean, I think I could say nicotine contains both the pyridine and pyrolilidine alkaloid. I mean, it's the only alkaloid we're going to talk about that actually has two uh, alkaloids. Uh, I think it's one of the ones that has two different types of alkaloids on it. And there are other lots of other compounds out there like that. Um, nicotine affects all wings of the, of the nervous system, uh, has lots of different effects. That's why I think people become so addicted to it, is one, it releases dopamine, which makes you feel good, and that's what happens in your central nervous system. But two, like, when you're stressed, you smoke. When you're relaxed, you smoke. When you uh, want to promote digestion, you smoke. If you smoke too much, it messes up your digestion. That's why it has all these complicated things. When people are smoking, they do a lot of spitting, and that's because it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. If you smoke too much, it dries out your mouth. That's because it's affecting the sympathetic nervous system. Like there's all these conflicting effects because it affects all the different wings of the nervous system. And depending on the dose, it's gonna have uh, different sort of uh, symptoms. Uh, someone's asking, does ayahuasca have the sludge effect? No. Well, yes, but no, it's different. It has nothing to do with the muscarinic receptors. We'll talk about that in a second. It has to do with serotonin receptors. So again, nicotine binds to all these different wings of the uh, nervous system. Tropane alkaloids. These are a very interesting group of compounds. Uh, and kind of fun from an ethnobotany standpoint, cultural standpoint, you may have heard of Deadly nightshade. So deadly nightshade comes from the plant called Atropa belladonna, which means beautiful woman in Latin or Italian or wherever it came from. And the reason why it's called that is because if you take the berries and you take an extract and put the eye drops made from deadly nightshade, it'll cause the pupils to dilate. And it does that because it's having that effect uh, on the nervous system. 
But unlike the sympathetic, stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, which will cause that, if you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, it causes constriction of the pupils. So stress makes them open and suppressing or um, stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system causes it to close. Atropine doesn't stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, but it can produce some symptoms that are a lot like that. Rather, what it does is it suppresses the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you suppress the parasympathetic nervous system, then kind of like the sympathetic response often dominates. So it'll have some indications where if you, if you basically block, going back here, if you block the parasympathetic nervous system, all of your juices, all of your liquids in your body dry up. So you'll get a dry mouth, You'll stop sweating, you won't urinate, you won't defecate, you don't, you suppress stomach acid, bile, everything else. So this little picture basically shows a little belladonna berry, which is bright red. And the reason why it's red is because it's overheating because he's not sweating because he's in the middle of the desert. That's why I've got the sun and everything there. So it's overheating. Also, the pupils are dilated, just like you would see with a sympathetic nervous response. Uh, but rather this is occurring because you're blocking the parasympathetic. Okay. So you can use this to shut down digestive function. So these herbs could be used, for example, with people with a stomach ulcer or someone who has severe, uh, cramping pains in their, uh, intestinal cramp, uh, tract, uh, like they're passing a gallstone, uh, or, um, Eye drops. So ophthalmologists will use eye drops that contain atropine. Uh, you might use it to dry up the mouth if you needed to for some reason. Um, problem with these substances though is what else? Oh, motion sickness. Also, this is the antidote atropine. The military personnel will carry little uh, needles that contain atropine in case you're exposed to nerve gas. That is the antidote. If you've been exposed to it, you give yourself an injection of that. And it, it'll stop all that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, crying, and everything else. So it'll save your life, okay? The other thing with atropine is atropine is associated with witchcraft, which witches um, would use it as a hallucinogen. Not one I think is very safe to use. Ten of the pills from, from Deadly Night Shade could cause death. Uh, and so what often happens is low dose, you get the dry mouth. would be the first symptom that you'd experience. And then taking more of it, you'd probably would lose awareness and, and unlike things that are affecting serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors, uh, I don't really know how it works as hallucinogen, but most people would take it. Uh, they don't remember what happened. And um, the problem is the amount that you can use to hallucinate overlaps with the amount that could cause death. So not really safe. So it's not really something that you should be playing around with. Um, Another herb in the Solanaceae family, and Solanaceae family includes potatoes, tomatoes, uh, deadly nightshade, uh, bell pepper, so lots of good fruits and vegetables, eggplants. Uh, it also contains jimson weed, which is, or devil's trumpet, Datura stramonium. This is also used in herbal medicine. Uh, historically, the leaves were smoked for asthma. Ironically, you're smoking it for asthma, but it helps to open up the bronchioles. Um, it could be used for uh, asthma or a respiratory tract infection. Um, it was also used by um, shamans in Central and South America to a much lesser degree than things like peyote and ayahuasca and magic mushrooms because they're kind of higher risk. So when you're reading books uh, about the shamanistic use of this, they're... they're they're rarely used, that they are used, they're used with extreme caution. And they recognize that these are pretty risky things and I would never play around with these personally. So, when it comes to tropine alkaloids, the classic one is atropine. Scopolamine is another one that's uh, found in gypsum weed and it's used as a drug for motion sickness, but both atropine and scopolamine are common ones. Atropine is like the classic archetypal one. Another fun or interesting one to know about is Cocaine. Now, cocaine does not act as a um, um, uh, anticholinergic. So, an anticholinergic is a substance that basically blocks the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So, again, anticholinergic, anti 
cholinergic, cholinergic receptors. So those muscarinic or cholinergic receptors, it blocks it. Um, so cocaine does not block the parasympathetic nervous system. It actually stimulates uh, the sympathetic nervous system by getting a stimulating the body to release more dopamine and probably epinephrine and norepinephrine to some degree. The take home with tropian alcohol is kind of dangerous. You don't want to mess around with them. Cocaine is pretty addictive. Uh, death has been associated with all the herbs that contain tropian alkaloids. Okay, so it can, has a narrow therapeutic index, which means the amount that might be used in medicine or recreationally. Uh, is very close to the amount that can cause serious side effects and death, okay? So, careful. Uh, this is just a little summary of the different ways that you've got uh, pyocarpine and muscarine will bind to the muscarinic receptors. Atropine, which is anticholinergic, it blocks binding to the muscar muscarinic receptors. And then you've got the phytostigamine, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, breaks or blocks the breakdown of acetylcholine, so there's more of it around to drive it over here. So if you're exposed to the nerve gas, the atropine is the antidote. Uh, here's a little picture of the coca plant in, um, I took that in Peru, I think. Very benign looking plant. And down there, indigenous people chew on the leaves. Appreciate chewing the leaves of the coca plant it does have cocaine in it, but it's very, very small amounts. And in that culture, it's considered to be um, the plants revered. Everybody chews it. It's used for altitude sickness. It's used for endurance as a stimulant, like how we might take coffee or tea. And just remember, even though cocaine or crack is, you know, so destructive on people's lives, when you look at chewing on the coca leaf, it actually has a lot of beneficial nutritional properties to it. it helps good medicines good for uh certain conditions um and it's not damaging to the culture so it's amazing how the processing of it just like if you look at um you know some food like fruit is like the coca leaf and pure white sugar is the equivalent of kind of cocaine you know the more you process it and refine it the more different and dangerous it becomes. So cocaine or things related to cocaine, I mean, cocaine was historically used in medicine. Uh, Freud for a little while was like, oh, cocaine's great. It's not, addic not addictive, it's great for mood, great you know, for stimulating uh, uh, energy. It used to be in Coca-Cola was a source of cocaine. They used to make wines with coca leaf. Um, but then obviously, they started realizing it could cause a lot of problems. And the way that it works is it blocks norepinephrine transporters, so it blocks the storage of norepinephrine and dopamine to some degree, um, so there's more of an available cosmetic release. When you chew it, you get less of a spike than uh, if you're snorting it. The big danger, so here's coca leaf for sale in Peru, and there's a pre-Columbian artifact where they used to uh, mix the coca leaf with a little bit of um, uh, uh, shells like um, uh, shells that contain basic calcium carbonate and acts as a bit of a buffer. So that's what cocaine does. Inhibits the re reuptake of the epinephrine and the dopamine, making more of it available to have its effect. Okay? Uh, as an aside, when people are doing crack, the big difference between crack and cocaine is they've basically free basic. And what that means is they've added baking soda to it. And so if you look at, I'm going to go back for a second. Why do I not have a picture of cocaine? Uh, I guess I did put a picture in. Um, when you add acid, um, it can protonate these uh, these nitrogens and that'll add like an H group onto it and add a plus onto it and that makes it more water, so water soluble. When you add the baking soda to, to it, it removes the hydrogen associated with it, removes that positive charge so it no longer is water soluble and so that allows a couple things. One, it can diffuse your cell membranes and go into the brain at a much higher 
faster rate. And two, it becomes more heat stable so you can smoke it. So it's amazing how the additional removal of one proton um, can make something like cocaine is pretty risky for sure. But there's a lot of high functioning. It's like a white collar drug. There's a lot of high functioning people who have a cocaine addiction. If you've ever seen anyone who've, who's been hooked on crack, it's a completely different monster altogether. And because it's such a stronger high, um, people, most people when I work at Parkdale who've tried crack, they can never get off of it. Um, and uh, I had one guy who used to do cocaine recreationally in the 80s. He said, yeah, I like to party, I like do coke. And that wasn't the best thing for me. But he said, then I tried crack because I thought it was not a big difference. He says, I couldn't control the crack. And he said, and this is like 20 years later, he's still addicted to it. You know, and he'll go through periods of not doing it, and then he kind of spirals and do little periods, and that's scary. So, uh, I've tried coca leaf in the Amazon, and it's pleasant. It's like having a cup of coffee. I don't, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, and it's not addictive. Like, uh, cocaine, I think you gotta be, uh, you're, you're taking some risks by doing that because it's a relatively, uh, may not seem like a big deal, but a lot of people, gotten addicted to it um but when you can bring out the crack crack is just going to destroy you no matter who you are it's going to have a big big negative effect on your on your life so coca leaf i'm fine with cocaine i don't think that's a smart idea to get start playing around with that crack don't even look at it just run away from that um next group of alkaloids we're going to talk about are the piperidines piperidine the main one that I can think of is piperine, which is found in black pepper. And piperine is what gives pepper its pungent sort of taste. Um, it has a number of functions. It increases, irritates the intestinal tract, brings in more blood flow, so it acts as a carminative, as a digestive aid. This is the compound, presumably, in black pepper that might help the absorption of certain uh, drugs or phytochemicals like curcumin in turmeric. So um, I don't really know of a lot. There are some other piperine alkaloids, but that's the one. The reason why I'm saying it is, the reason why I'm using that as an example is that uh, one, presumably that's the one where um, it got its name from black pepper. And two, it's easy to remember because piper, 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 pepper, very similar names, piperidine. So they're all kind of in there. Um, Beyond that, that's all you have to know. I might ask a question like, black pepper contains the following class of compounds or compound piperine or piperine alkaloids. Uh, I might use something like that. I will not ask you six-membered ring or anything like that. I might ask you, I, I don't think I do, but I could ask you, uh, you know, a question like my words like, uh, which of the following compounds is found in black pepper and is responsible for its pungent taste and uh, may affect the absorption of certain, increased absorption of certain drugs? Is it A, curcumin, B, piperine, C, uh, berberine? Like that might be a question I might ask, okay? Now another piperidine alkaloid, which is an interesting herb or compound is lobeline. So Indian tobacco, which is referred to as uh, Lobelia inflata. Um, this is used, this is a, I don't think it's existed in, in Europe. Um, this is a herb in North America called Indian tobacco, and it can be smoked. Historically, it's used to help with the respiratory infections, but it also has an effect where it induces emesis. And emesis basically means it makes you vomit, okay? And there's a couple ways that it does that. Um, one, when you take small amounts of it, it induces vomiting center in the brain. And so I'm sure everyone out there has vomited at some point. Like, you know when you're going to vomit because the first thing you'll notice is that you start to feel a little nauseous and then <clears throat> you'll start to salivate. And that's one of the big things. And you'll start to salivate and it starts to increase mucus production in order to protect your esophagus from all that acid that's about to come up, you know? So you'd be like, ooh, you could feel it. you're just trying to swallow all that, and you know it's coming. And that's the first step. So if you take a little bit of Indian tobacco, it makes you salivate and increases mucus production, 
in not just the respiratory tract, but also in the respiratory tract. And so by making the mucus in your lungs more thin and watery, it loosens it up and makes it kind of washes it out of the lungs so you can cough it up or expectorate it. If you take a little bit more of it uh, in a higher amount, instead of just acting as an expectorant, it'll make you vomit. So it doesn't do it right away. So you can use uh, Indian tobacco in herbal medicine for respiratory tract infections like asthma or serious bronchitis. And then side effect is insensitive people may make you feel nauseous or if you take too much, it'll make you vomit. Now, another interesting thing that it can be used for is smoking cessation. And it's a classic kind of remedy used for um, to help people with smoking cessation. And it's not like it replaces tobacco, but rather you start taking it while you're still smoking. And it appears to work by a couple of ways. It modulates, so both kind of blocks and turns on uh, uh, your nicotinic receptors so that you don't get the same high from the tobacco. So it doesn't cause that major surge in dopamine that you get when you smoke a cigarette. Uh, so you don't get the same enjoyment out of it. Uh, and it also leaves more dopamine floating around um, in the nervous system so that you feel a little bit less needy for the dopamine as well, okay? So what's interesting is they haven't done these studies in humans, and as a smoking cessation, didn't really, they had one trial I read a long time ago, it didn't seem to be that effective, but maybe they didn't use it to start at the right time or whatever, but I think it does have potential for work to, uh, to work for some people. But in animal studies, they found that it does, um, for rats given lobeline, which is the main uh, papyridine alkaloid, is that it appears to um, decrease the reward mechanism associated with amphetamine, so crystal meth, and, or crack. So you don't get the same high from dopamine, so it's much easier for you to give it up if you're not getting, if you're not feeling that good from it. So. There may be some benefit for using it for, for addiction and related things, which is kind of neat. Um, so the way it works is it modulates these nicotine receptors and it does increase um, or inhibits the, the reuptake of dopamine so there's more of it floating around and serotonin to a less degree, okay? Now on the topic of nicotinic receptors, we talked about how they're involved with sympathetic, parasympathetic, central nervous system and where they affect dopamine. And we also talked about the somatic nervous system. Now if you have ever heard of Socrates, Socrates was a famous great philosopher who basically was uh, sentenced to death because he was basically uh, encouraging young people to think critically and the governments at the time liked that, okay? So they said, okay, we're going to have to execute you. How do you want to go? And he went by drinking hemlock, okay? So poison hemlock is conium maculatum. We don't have this in North America. We have another type of poison hemlock in North America. And what uh, water hemlock does, it contains a compound called conine. And what conine does is it basically blocks nicotinic receptors and inhibits them from firing. And primarily what happens is it will start causing ascending paralysis. What that means is first you find that you can't move your feet, and then your legs, and then you uh, start affecting the abdomen. And then eventually it kind of gets up to the lungs and heart where you just stop breathing and your heart stops beating. And uh, Plato wrote a book, I forgot what it's called, I took it in uh, philosophy. And basically Socrates is talking about his experience drinking the poison hemlock and how he can feel that his legs aren't working and he dies, you know. And, and um, so you will never use this in herbal medicine. But I will say, if you look at poison hemlock, it's in this... APAC family. It's in the same family as um, fennel, anise, caraway, dill, uh, carrot, parsnip. And you know what? It would be very hard to tell the difference between the two of them if you didn't know what you're looking at. And you might think to yourself, oh, this is, you know, uh, here's some uh, 
uh, caraway or fennel or whatever it is, and you take it, you eat it, and then you die. And there have been reports, and there is a poisonous version that works by a different mechanism in North America that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from. So watch out uh, when you're gathering members from the Apiaceae family. There's a lot of good ones in this family, but there are some poisonous ones. I think the guy from Into the Wild died from some variety of APCA plant uh, in Alaska that he took. But anyways, so conine, this is also a pyperidine alkaloid. Interestingly, like lobeline, which affects nicotinic receptors, but doesn't cause paralysis, this uh, interacts, with, interacts with the somatic nervous system in your muscles and blocks that from firing, so you die of paralysis, which is unfortunate. Now, moving on, we've talked about epinephrine, norepinephrine, various things that affect nicotinic, muscarinic, adrenergic receptors. Now, we're going to talk about serotonin. So, serotonin is made from tryptophan, which gets converted to 5-HTP, which I sometimes give as a supplement to people with depression or anxiety, uh, also weight loss. And then it gets converted, the 5-HTP makes both serotonin and melatonin, okay? There are different serotonergic receptors in the body. Some of them are involved with mood, so serotonin is like the happy uh, neurotransmitter, but it also regulates your body temperature, sleep. Uh, it can affect vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Uh, some of them can cause hallucinations, some of them can cause vomiting, and so lots of different effects. And so depending, some herbs or drugs will target a certain receptor to either stimulate or block it and not interact with another one, okay? So in general, this is like a little picture. It might help you remember uh, mood, blood vessels, hallucinations, digestive function, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and thermal regulation for heat. Now, if you take, if you're taking an antidepressant drug like Prozac, uh, uh, fluoxetine, I should mention the, the brand name, fluoxetine, and you were to take a certain herb like St. John's wort that also works on serotonin, you could have a fatal side effect called serotonin syndrome. And this basically causes it too much serotonin. So if you have too much epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, you could have a hypertensive crisis, and that could be caused by a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or you know, taking too much, too many stimulants could cause uh, your blood pressure to go up and your heart rate to go up. With serotonin syndrome, uh, this can also be dangerous. So you get mental excitations. So you're really happy. You're euphoric. So imagine someone's like overdosing on ecstasy. Uh, and while, if someone took ecstasy while the drug will be on uh, MDMA, while on uh, an antidepressant, they might start hallucinating. Uh, get really confused, start overheating, start getting nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, grinding of the teeth, which is bruxism, uh, lots of muscle twitching, and then cause uh, cardiovascular issues with high blood pressure and increased heart rate, okay? So be careful when you're messing around with these things. Now, the alkaloids that do appear to in interact with serotonin receptors, many of them are indole alkaloids. So this is the indole group. So serotonin contains an indole group. So no surprise, a lot of the herbs that have this indole-like structure, these alkaloids, will interact with serotonin receptors. And I could ask you an exam question on that for sure, okay? Now, reserpine, uh, this is an interesting uh, compound. It's not used, it could be used as a drug, it is available, but people rarely use it. What it does is that basically, uh, affects sympathetic tone. So what it does is it basically depletes the body of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. Uh, and the way it does that is it prevents the storage of these neurotransmitters in the vesicles. And so there's something called a monoamine transporter that's attached on the outside of these vesicles that once these neurotransmitters go into the nerve, it gets stored inside here. And if it's not stored, then what happens is the enzyme monoamine oxidase can degrade them and deplete them. So it's kind of like, um, you know, you've got your sheep or your cows are out in the field and you got to bring it and fence them back in. And this is like the gate to the fence. 
but the reserve pin basically blocks the gate so you can't open it. So as a result, the monoamine, i.e. the wolf, can go and eat your sheep, so to speak. Okay? So that's how that works. So when you deplete epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, there's less of them around to affect um, your sympathetic nervous system. So blood pressure and heart rate goes down. So in high amounts, uh, I mean, this stuff works. I've only used it a couple of times in practice and not for a long time because years ago, I don't know, I, I don't know if it was legal or illegal or what, but we used it in the clinic for some patients. I think it was never said it wasn't illegal. You know, no one ever said anything, so I think people were using it. Uh, and it worked in a very, very difficult case of high blood pressure. Now, um, and it's originally from India. Um, now, one of the side effects that can happen is because because it also depletes dopamine, it can cause low libido and it can cause depression and some other things. In Ayurvedic medicine, not only do they use it for blood pressure and cardiovascular conditions, but they use it for schizophrenia and psychotic and psychosis, which result from too much dopamine. So, you know, I think this is, I like understanding how things work. So reserve beans working by a few different mechanisms. Um, and one of them is by depleting epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So it affects serotonin as well, just to mention. And the basic structure has that indole structure. Now there's another herb, uh, another um, important indole alkaloid called ergotamine. Now ergotamine comes from the ergot fungus. Now, if you've ever ha heard of lysergic acid diethylamine or LSD, which is the hallucinant drug that was pretty big in the 60s, uh, like a Woodstock, everyone was taking acid uh, or LSD. Um, it was originally extracted from a fungus called the ergot fungus by uh, a chemist called Hoffman. And he accidentally discovered it and started hallucinating because he spilt it on his hand. And then he isolated it and that's where it came from. But in addition, the ergot fungus had LSD, but it also had ergotamine. Now, ergotamine also interacts with serotonin receptors, but it doesn't cause hallucinations. Rather, it affects primarily the, um, the cardiovascular system, and it causes severe basal constriction. So ergotamine can be used as an injection to basically uh, prevent postpartum hemorrhaging. It can also be used for people with severe migraines because it will cause basal constriction and help to relieve those migraines. So this is a very, very powerful drug. Uh, you don't want to use this unless you absolutely have, have to. Now, as an aside for migraines, I've had amazing success treating migraines just by giving, removing food sensitivities and making sure that they're not low in iron, just as an aside. There's herbs you can use for it too, like ginger, but uh, which also works on serotonin receptors. But I would uh, always start with removing iron or removing food sensitivities and supplementing with iron if it's indicated. That's just a little side note. So ergonomine, I think that I could ask you a question like uh, on the exam, which of the following substance can help uh, stop bleeding by interacting with serotonin receptors? Is it A, ergonomine? Is it B, curcumin? No, that might be something I might ask on the exam. Uh, or I might say LSD and ergotamine are both known to be A, uh, indole alkaloids, B, uh, pyrolizidine alkaloids, something like that, okay? Lots of side effects. You don't really have to know a lot of this stuff. It's a little overkill on here. The big take home is ergotamine, indole alkaloid, serotonin receptors, stops bleeding, basal constriction, okay? Now, another... Uh, indole alkaloid that we've talked about already is the dimethyltryptophan. And this is naturally produced in your brain when you have a near-death experience or when you are dreaming. It's also found in certain herbs. Now, chacruna, uh, this is a herb, uh, I took this down the Amazon. Uh, this is one of the herbs in the ayahuasca mixture. But if you take chacruna on its own, there's very little effect that it has because the dimethyltryptophan is inactivated by the monoamine oxidase enzyme in your gut. So remember when we talked about tyramine earlier on and how if you eat a lot of like red wine and cured meats and chocolate, um, we don't have increased heart rate and blood pressure and have a hypertensive crisis because we have that enzyme. So 
one of the things that we have to do in order, well, you don't have to do this, one of the things that you have to do in order to absorb the dimethyltryptophan, because that's what you want in this case, is to inhibit that monoamine oxidase enzyme. So there's another group of indoalkaloid compounds called harmala alkaloids. Uh, harmala alkaloids is found in the ayahuasca plant. So when you combine a harmaline, which is the harmala alkaloid, with a monoamine, like dimethyltryptophan or tyramine, you will then absorb it and have that effect from the corresponding phytochemical, okay? So ayahuasca contains this. Also, there are some other plants, including passion flower. Now, passion flower, I, have, I do often recommend that to people as a gentle sedative. Um, it's commonly used in herbal medicine. I have no issues with it. It does have a uh, monoamine oxidase enzyme, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor in it. It's pretty gentle. I don't know how much of a concern it would be combining passion flower with an antidepressant drug or eating some cured meat. I don't think it's as powerful as the prescription version of these, the drug version of these, but they something to still be aware of though, okay? So again, dimethyltryptophan combined with harmaline has a synergistic effect that produces hallucinations, okay? Um, if you do one alone, it doesn't do anything. You need to have both of them to have the effect. And it does so by inhibiting that monoamine oxidase enzyme, okay? So you also have to appreciate taking harmaline with a lot of tyramine containing foods could be problematic. Now that being said, where I was doing, uh, where I tried the ayahuasca down the Amazon, we had avocado with a bunch of the meals um, and nobody had any issues. So avocado is something that does contain tyramine. You're supposed to avoid it on a monoamine oxidase enzyme inhibitor. So it may, may not, you know, clinically be as significant as it sounds. Uh, just like there's people who take grapefruit juice when they're on a statin drug and it doesn't, that may not be a, as big a deal as you think, but you gotta be careful with this anyways, okay? Uh, someone's at, uh, someone's asked me, does LSD activate the DMT release in the brain? No, LSD I think directly, uh, it could, I don't know actually. Uh, it directly binds to serotonin receptors and the effects are completely different. They're the same family of drugs. They still work on serotonin receptors, but the visions between like magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, um, LSD, um, um, peyote, San Pedro's cactus, they share similarities. That's very different than other things like diviner sage or uh, atropine induced hallucinations. They're very similar, they're cousins, but they're not the same. So similar visions, but different as well, okay? Pyrolizine alkaloids, the only, thing you gotta, the only thing you have to remember about these is they cause liver problems. That's gonna come up later on. And they're found in a herb called comfrey, but lots of other herbs that uh, used in herbal medicine around the world contain pyrolizine alkaloids. But high dose of these will cause liver failure and this has been, uh, it can cause liver failure and liver cancer. And so Health Canada basically has put a warning on certain things saying you can't have comfrey internally because uh, it can cause liver problems. Although the reality is you can have other herbs like echinacea, colt's foot, borage, uh, which do contain these potentially toxic pyrolizine alkaloids, but in lesser amounts, uh, uh, they are found in uh, certain herbal preparations, okay? Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Isoquinoline alkaloids. So it's 11.49. So some of you guys in the classroom might be getting kicked out now. And luckily I'll be able to get through most of this before noon. So if you don't get kicked out, great. If you do, I'm sorry. So isoquinoline alkaloids. Um, there's a number that we're going to talk about. Isoquinoline, quinoline, and quinolizine alkaloids. Isoquinolines we've already talked about. That is berberine. It's a broad spectrum antimicrobial. It also is a digestive bitter. Most alkaloids taste bitter, but not all of them act as digestive bitters. Okay. Again, something like atropine tastes bitter, cocaine tastes bitter, but it won't, it actually has a suppressive effect on, on digestive function. Okay. 
So berberine is used primarily as an antimicrobial for funguses and bacteria. It appears to disrupt certain enzymes involved with making proteins. Um, it's found in golden seal, Oregon grape, barberry, coptis. You can also find ice quinoline alkaloids in um, um, bloodroot and chalodonium. So they're all antimicrobials. Some of them are escoriatic herbs that kind of can be used to a little bit irritating. Um, some of them have an antispasmodic effect. Also, opium from the opium poppy it also falls. It, it's kind of a nice cleaning alkaloid as well. Um, just as an aside. So these guys are all in the same. Uh, I don't. I don't think they're all in the same family, but they're definitely one level up above that. Uh, if they're not in the same family, they're all cousins or second cousins to each other. Okay. Now, another in interesting isoquinoline alkaloid, uh, and this is more for anyone who likes science fiction, you know, or history. You know, there's a lot of meat history around plants. So you've probably heard of curare or tubo curare. And this comes from um, a plant that grows in Central and South America. And uh, indigenous people in the Amazon used to use it for hunting. So they'd take, they'd have a blow gun, and they'd take the darts and dip them in uh, a paste made from uh, some poisonous frogs as well as uh, tubocararine, which is from a strychnose toxifera plant. And they would use this to basically blow them at birds or monkeys in the trees. And it doesn't kill them directly usually, but what ends up happening is it blocks nicotinic receptors at the postsynaptic uh, membrane. And so what it ends up doing is it causes paralysis. Now, the reason why they use darts is because if you ingested Karari internally, you won't absorb it. That isoquinoline alkaloid is too big to cross the intestinal tract. So internally, it will not cause paralysis. Um, but if you inject it, it will. So it was once used in surgeries. They've kind of stopped doing that because it's a little bit too high risk and they've replaced it with other things. But what's kind of freaky about it is if you were exposed to it and you were kind of stabbed or punctured with it, exposed to the curare, you basically would have paralysis, but you'd remain conscious. So you could still, you'd know exactly what's going on and you could still feel pain. You just can't do anything about it, which is awful. So uh, I remember the TV show Heroes, they were using curare at one point uh, for one of the scenes in it, but uh, there you go. So again, it blocks the acetylcholine receptor on the somatic in the somatic nervous system, and that uh, blocks the sodium channels or sodium ions from flowing in to cause contractions to the skeletal muscle. Another interesting isoquinoline alkaloid is emetine. Now, emetine causes emesis. So serum syrup of ipecac is um, used to be used for overdose and poisoning. And so they basically would give this to people if they've ingested a drug or a kid who's swallowed something they're not supposed to, and it basically purges them out. And there's a few different ways that it works. Um, probably it interacts with serotonin receptors because if you stimulate certain serotonin receptors, it'll cause nausea and vomiting. Um, the other thing that's used for by indigenous people in, in you know, Central and South America is to treat certain infections from like, uh, like amoebic dysentery. And so they give it, basically one, it makes you vomit. So if you ate, if you had food poisoning, you would vomit by taking this. And it also directly has some antimicrobial effects. So like berberine, it can kill certain parasites, which is cool. Okay. So the only thing you really need to know is I would say isoquinoline alkaloids, that's important for herbs like berberine, but some other interesting things that you will never use in practice, like emetine from syrup of epicac and curare, which uh, is used by hunting in, in uh, Central South America, or it was, until they were exposed to guns. Now, guns are probably more efficient. Quinoline alkaloids, there's only one that I really think you need to remember, and that's quinine, and that's in tonic water. And we've already talked about quinine. It comes from the chinchona tree. You don't need to know the Latin genus species for this. The main properties of this is an antimicrobial against malaria in particular. Tonic water is a 
digestive tonic. That's why it's called tonic water. So it helps promote digestion. It's very bitter. Also, as an aside, you don't need to know this, but it's used for, it has some effects on the cardiovascular system as well. Uh, and that's associated with some of the side effects. High amounts of quinine is not good for you. Sometimes they'll give it to people with like restless legs. Um, there's a couple uh, uh, autoimmune diseases they also give it to. So there's some other weird indications for it as well. The difference between the isoquinolines and the quinoline is where the nitrogen is positioned. So quinoline, it's at the number one position. Berberine, it's at the number two position, okay? Both quinoline and berberine are antimicrobials and digestive bitters. That's the take off of the both those. And that's a nice little picture I took down in South America of the quinine plant. Um, someone asked before how the quinine versus artemisinin, how they worked. If you remember, artemisinin is a sesquiterpene lactone from a wormwood variety that grows in China. And this peroxide bridge here interacts with free heme that contains iron that causes free radical generation. And now this artemisinin radical will then interact with proteins and DNA in the body and basically destroy it, okay? Uh, the quinine does not work directly. Um, it works, sorry, it works by a different mechanism, is that it basically inhibits the polymerization of free heme. And free heme is a toxic thing that generates free radicals. And so when quinine inhibits this heme polymerase enzyme, you get more free heme around, it generates more free radicals and causes destruction. And so when you have drug resistance, that's caused by multi-drug resistant pumps and flavonolignans help to inhibit drug resistance by uh, pumping the quinine out of the cells. So that's just, I'm trying to bring in a few different things here. So perhaps a good anti-malarial would be combining and I do know that when they do um, uh, most of the um, artemisin-based anti-malarials that are on the market, they don't give artemisin on its own. They always combine it with other things. Maybe not quinine, but some like maybe methylquin, which is related to quinine, um, so that you don't get disease resistance as much, and also you get more of a synergistic effect. Okay. Uh, Quinolizidines. Only thing I want you to remember here is blue, co blue cohosh contains one of these compounds. These compounds have been used historically in herbal medicine for cardiovascular disease to stimulate heart rate. Um, and there have been some concerns with using blue cohosh in pregnant women, and we'll talk about that more later on. So this is the quinolizidine. The nitrogen's in the middle position. So it's an antiarrhythmic. So it helps with cardiovascular issues, and it may be used for as an amenagogue to assist uh, to stimulate menstrual cycle, menses, and maybe help with childbirth. But that's a, I don't like this plant, so it's, it's a bad plant for that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to be done in one just a couple seconds. The last group of compounds, when we talked about alkaloids, they contain the nitrogen. The other interesting group of compounds are called organosulfur compounds. Take home for this, they contain sulfur. So some of these sulfur-containing compounds are used as antimicrobials. They can be used as antioxidants. Not that they directly absorb. I mean, I guess they probably could. But many of these can also be used to stimulate glutathione production, which is a great antioxidant in the liver. Uh, these have huge anti-cancer effects. Uh, one, they can slow down phase one detox, which increases carcinogenic compounds. And two, they can speed up phase two detox, which has uh, a positive effect on detoxifying these toxic substances as well. Uh, many of these things have neuroprotective effects as well, so they've been uh, suggested to be useful for um, Alzheimer's and other conditions. So the main two areas where you get these are cruciferous vegetables, which includes Brussels sprouts, broccoli sprouts, uh, broccoli as well, kale, rapini, uh, and also in uh, members of the garlic family, so onion, garlic, scallions. So that pungent, sulfury taste that not everybody likes is associated with these compounds. So forofane is one of the most researched things. I think my advice to all my patients is eat 
something in the Nebraska family every single day if you can. And broccoli sprouts are have the highest concentration. When you cook broccoli and rapini, you do lose some of the stuff, so it may be better. Um, broccoli sprouts, if you're trying to use it therapeutically for a certain condition, you're going to get way more of these sulforaphanes. Now, the sulforaphanes exist as glycosides in these plants, and when you crush them up, uh, it activates an enzyme that helps to activate and release these sulforaphanes. Allicin is one of the main compounds in garlic. I'll come back, back to that in a second. And then there's also some amino acids in your diet, like cysteine and methionine, that contain sulfur. Both of these are essential nutrients, or one of them is at least essential. Um, but if you're interested in longevity, check out something called methionine deficient diets. So one of the amino acids that you have in meat that you don't get in vegetable proteins in significant amounts. So cheese, meat, and eggs are rich in cysteine and methionine. And it appears that those, although you need them, they are used to make glutathione. They do have antioxidant effects. The higher amounts of these seems to be associated with more dying. So um, although you do need cysteine, and it's important for phase 2 detox, too much of it, the act as a prooxidant, and I think it turns on certain genes that can cause uh, you to die sooner. So watch how much of these guys you consume. I do prescribe cysteine to some people for respiratory issues, but long term I would never want people to do it. And another reason why I don't like weightlifters to be taking all that whey powder, which has high amounts of cysteine and methionine in it, they should be doing more of a, a vegan-based protein. That's just my opinion. So with cruciferous vegetables, you can spend an entire lecture learning, like three hours just learning about cruciferous vegetables and the health benefits. These are really, really important. As far as fruits and vegetables go, um, yeah, you want fruits and vegetables, but you got to get some of these cruciferous. So if you don't like broccoli, then try rapini, try kale, do broccoli sprouts, take a supplement if you have to. But for cancer and heart disease, um, really, really important things. And uh, and they work differently than the phenolic compounds. Okay, probably synergistically. Um, now the garlic, your slide is not going to be great with this. I apologize. It's going to be a little blurry. It's a picture of it, not the actual text, because I I lost my one. So garlic is a great antimicrobial. So you can buy supplements that contain allicin. Fresh garlic. What happens is when you crush the garlic, it has an enzyme called allinase that produces allicin, which is uh, the main antimicrobial that quickly oxidizes to, begin, to become aohene and the diallele sulfide. So if you want to get the benefits out of garlic as far as a uh, antimicrobial, allicin, I think, is the main active compound. And some of the products that are promoted more for cardiovascular disease are going to be the fermented garlic products. And they're going to have higher amounts of these guys. And these guys help to lower blood pressure and triglycerides, um, but may not be as effective. At least that's what the manufacturers of the Allison products say, that uh, this is what you want for infections. From personal experience, I found that crushed garlic is great when you add olive oil for ear infections, if you make it up as you go. If you make it up and it sits for a week or so, and then you try to use it, it doesn't seem to work as well. So maybe that's just because the uh, allicin is becoming oxidized. So garlic is great as an antimicrobial and great for cardiovascular disease, may help with cancer, but it depends on the form that it's used. Um, and we can't go into much detail over that. Okay, 12 o'clock, so we covered a bunch of stuff. So if you guys have to leave the classroom, you can. Maybe what I'll do is I'll go through uh, and just a couple sample questions. Can you guys confirm that you can see the list of review questions I posted on the, where was that? Uh, and if anyone's in the classroom, you can just shut down the, the projector right now and turn it off and it shouldn't affect me. Uh, so if you go to the announcements and you log in, exam review, final, Chemical lectures three to five are here, and introduction lecture one to two are here. Okay, so if I go in here, uh, uh, oh, slides in here for the. 
Uh, no, you should memorize. I don't really want you memorizing a whole lot. So, uh, so I'm going to say no. Too much info. Okay. So, you guys can see that, obviously. It's on Moodle. Okay, so let me go through. I'm going to ask you guys some exam questions. Uh, anyone in the classroom, can you guys let me know if you're getting kicked out of there? I'm just curious if you're already over there. Yeah. So, I'm going to go through. I got the exam sitting in front of me here. Uh, well, one of the versions of the exam. So here's, for example, for the first lecture on the history, I might say, which famous book was written in China or Egypt or by the Greek philosopher this? Is it A, the canon of medicine, C, the Materia Medica, D, Ebers Papyrus? So that might be a question. Uh, which of the following statements is false regarding shamanism? Uh, a, shamanism is practiced only in Mexico. B, uh, I'm making up some, some questions. Uh, shamans believe that uh, spirits affect health, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I might say this system of medicine, I might be Kempo, Greco-Roman, traditional Chinese medicine, etc., originates from A, Africa, B, India, C, the Middle East. Uh, another question on history. Which of the, uh, this legendary person, so it could be uh, a Greek guy or it could be a Chinese guy, uh, was believed to be the founder of Greco-Roman medicine, or Chinese medicine, or whatever it may be. Um, this medical practice evolved from this medical practice. So, it might be, um, you know, Greco-Roman medicine came out of Egyptian medicine, Unani medicine, uh, may have evolved from Greco Roman, uh, Kempo medicine evolved from Chinese medicine. Uh, here's a question What does, if you're using the scientific name, what does that refer to? Does it refer to the family, to the genus, species, to the order? What is that? Uh, who developed the system of Greco-Roman medicine, who developed a system, uh, um, who rejected the system of Greco-Roman medicine and the notion of the, of the humors. Um, a Neanderthal was found with a little bag with some herbs in it. Uh, sorry about the noise in the background. You know, what is that? Uh, and what I've done is, I've, I've created, sorry, my receptionist has some nice people out there. One of the things that I've done with the exam, I've created a fairly equal amount of questions on each of the sections, okay? So we've got, hold on. I should have started with this. Uh, going down. So we had, I think we've had five lectures. So the first lecture, we did the history. There's nine questions on that. The second lecture was kind of like the drugs, how the drugs work, a little bit more about pharmacology related stuff. I had nine questions on that. Okay. So because the introduction lecture, I didn't cover it. Like it's kind of like was, the one lecture was covered over two things. Uh, and then we did the phytochemistry stuff. We had basically three lectures, although we kind of, it got changed. We had the, uh, the carbohydrates, we had the uh, resins, the terpenoids. That was the first lecture of the phytochemicals. That's 19 questions. 
And then we had the phenolics, which we did last week. But because we were starting late, I had to do uh, some of them this week as well. So there's 19 questions of that. And then finally, I had 19 questions of the alkaloids, which we had, I covered today in about two hours or I think it was two hours, roughly. An hour and a half. Okay. So 19 questions for the first PDF, 19 questions for the second PDF, 19 questions for the third PDF, and 19 questions for the fourth PDF, I believe. So 75 questions total. Okay. Let me go back to what I was doing. Uh, so I had a, here's a question, which of the following is true or false regarding berberines and 5-HC? Uh, I had a question on which of the following drugs, and I might say it occurs in nature or it does not occur in nature, or it's made from this or it's not made from that. Is it A, Taxol, B, Tamiflu, C, Dijoxin, or D, Ephedrine? Okay. Uh, and talked about which of the following drugs was used for malaria. There's a couple of them that could have been used. Uh, which of the following statements is true about drugs? They're safe or about herbs. They're safer than drugs or they usually have multiple active ingredients. They have one, they have whatever. Another true false against uh, this one's about uh, let's say digital so digoxin in um, foxglove. How does it work, or what about the history of it? It's like a true false question that's involving a few things there. Which of the following statements is true about taxol? You know, I might be talking about how it works, what it does, history of it, something like that. True, false around uh, ephedrine. Ephedrine comes up again later on. So we've got it in the first lecture, but you could also have ephedrine coming up a second time later on. So ephedrine is one of the ones you should know. Make sure you know the difference between pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, toxicology, pharmacognosy. Uh, Remember that pharmacodynamic is talks about how the drug interacts with the receptor in your body, so what the drug does on the body. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. Toxicology refers to whether it's going to hurt you or not. Pharmacognosy is talking about natural substances. Okay. I might ask you a question about beta glucans, 1, 3, 1, 6, 1, 2, 1, 5, alpha, beta, something like that. So make sure you know that. Uh, question on cardioglycosides, you know, maybe what they do or what class of compounds do they belong to. Uh, you know, I might ask you which of the following is a polyphenol. And I may ask, is it A, a monoterpenoid, or is B, is it a... Uh, Stilbenoid or C is it whatever it could be? Uh, question about olive oil, what's in it? Uh, here's the question on what compound is most water soluble or fat soluble? And uh, water soluble, it's not a hard question because we know that. Carbohydrates are water soluble, and we know that terpenoids are not water soluble. Phenolics are kind of water soluble, but not very water soluble. So sugars are always going to be carbohydrates and mucilage and gels and all those things are going to be far more soluble than resins are, uh, and phenolics even. Uh, I might ask a question: Which of the following plants contains a uh, this compound or this class of compound and I might say coffee or I might say tomatoes or I might say licorice or I might and for herbs appeared in multiple places it's more likely to be asked so 
Uh, if we've talked about blueberries multiple times, blueberry, I could ask you which of the following class of compounds are in blueberries. Uh, uh, if I've only talked about, let's say, today we talked about naphthoquinones, I mentioned black walnut. It's still fair game, but I'm, I might say black walnuts, you know, is used as an antimicrobial contains which of the following compounds. I could ask you that, though. Um, I might talk about, you know, what types of compounds are in sports creams, or I might talk about what types of compounds are in um, essential oils, or I might say, like, I think it's worth knowing that things like menthol in peppermint oil or eucalyptol is in eucalyptus oil or camphor, like those are all essential oils used in sports creams. Um, which of the following is false about triterpenoids? Uh, you know, knowing that essential oils contain smaller things, either monoterpenoids or sesquiterpenoids, sometimes diterpenoids, also found propenes or would follow that. I think that's good. I think it's good knowing which things were, we talked about a few things that had phytoestrogenic effects. So we had the isoflavones, we had lignans, we had um, stilbenoids, steroidal saponins to some degree. I don't know if we talked about that a lot though. Uh, here's a question about gums and mucilage have all the following properties associated with it. Actions like A, uh, can act as a laxative, or B, whatever it could be. Um, we talked about essential oils and how do you get them, and so what things would be obtainable that way. Here's a question about, for example, we talked about like quinine, we talked about artemisin. We talked about berberine numerous times. So I could ask you, you know, berberine is classified as A, a sesquiterpene, B, isoquinoline, because it came up a lot. Um, so know those ones that have come up multiple times. If you see that on more than one slide, remember the name of that, because I've had some of these things appear, like ephedrine appears on the first slide, and then it appears again in the isoquinoline or not the ice cream, in the um, uh, alkyl, proto-alkaloids, and then it's just been mentioned a few times, so none of those things, okay? Actually, ephedrines appeared on at least three different areas. Um, so I might have a question, like, something comes in, it's got... Um, here's a question where I have, it's got 15 carbons, or it's got 30 carbons, or it's got... 10 carbons, or it has lots of sugar molecules or whatever, what kind of compound is it? That might be it. I'm not going to ask how many has six carbons, uh, two, two, hydro, uh, two, uh, two six carbon rings with a nitrogen on it, which is cleanly. I would not ask you that. Uh, here's a question that's true or false based on tannins, volatile oils, phenolics. Uh, we had a question about, you know, what do you find in resin? What's the difference between resin, rosin, oleo resins, turpentine, things like that? Uh, here's something where I said, which of the following compounds could help prevent this disease and this type of cancer? Uh, it's worth remembering that carotenoids deposit in your skin. They help protect your skin. Uh, uh, you find a chemist analyzes some herbal extract that contains uh, alkaloids and mucilage and uh, some essential oils and some water and all these various things, you know, what, or if it contains uh, exclusively carbohydrates or if it contains uh, no water soluble components, is it A? A resin B, something like that. Uh, here's a question about coumarins. Is it true, false, the following? Uh, that's, I'm not going to go on that. Here's a question about phthalides. 
Remember, Phalides, Cumarins, Phrenocumarins are all in their own little family. They're kind of related to each other, similar function. Uh, I think it's worth noting that what catagens are, where you find them. Uh, I might ask a question like, Broccoli or garlic or onions or kale contains these class of compounds. Uh, I think we talked about soy and its phytochemicals a few times and sort of what they do. So I think in that case, it's good to know uh, the specific names that are in there. Also know uh, soy, know what their functions are, what group they belong to. Uh, we talked about, in general, what do naphthoquinones do? What do anthroquinones do? What do anthroquinone glycosides do? What do essential oils do? So I think it's good to know essential oils. Or carminatives are often essential oils. Adaptogens are uh, tritropinoid saponins. Uh, bulk laxatives are gels or, or soluble fibers. Stimulating laxatives usually are associated with anthroquinone glycosides. Cardiac glycosides work on the heart, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so I might say, which of the following compounds has 10 carbons and is found in the essential oil? Or which of the following compounds has uh, nine carbons uh, and is part of the essential oil? Or like that. Oh. So I could say like this herb contains this compound, which is classified as a A, naphthoquinone, B, polyphenolic, C, hydroquinone, or D, something like that. I might say which of the following are not polyphenolic. So we went through and we discussed uh, a whole bunch of different things that were polyphenolics. We know lignans are, we know that uh, the flavonoids are, we know that stuff like that. So which one may not be? Which of the statements is false regarding anthocyanidins? Uh, Plant-rich diet could contain lots of these things. Which of the following class of compounds act as anti-cancer antioxidants and phytoestrogens? Question about stilbenoids. Something about the grapefruit juice effect. Or two different types of compounds are grapefruit juice. Uh, know the difference between some of the what makes up a hydrolyzable tannin versus a condensed tannin. What's the difference? Here's a question that has a bunch of actions and it could be safe to consume on a daily basis. Which group of compounds would that be? Is it A, isoquinoline alkaloids, which as an aside would not be, in my opinion, safe to take every day. But anyways, that's not the question. Uh, B, something else. Milk thistle contains these things. which is false regarding tannins. This is condensed versus hydrolyzable. Uh, now we're getting into the alkaloids. So consuming these class of alkaloids would most likely produce, let's say, nausea, bombing, diarrhea, or and hallucinations and death, or cause pupil dilations, constriction. Is it A, uh, quinoline alkaloids, B, whatever? Uh, you know, what compound or group of compounds inhibit this enzyme or these enzymes? Uh, this compound causes this symptom by blocking the following enzymes or turning on it. 
binding this compound or group of compounds could cause hallucinations by binding to this. How does coffee work? What, which alkaloids, specific alkaloids, interacts with nicotine receptors? Because there's a few of them that we talked about. Which of the following is a parasympathomimetic? Or which of the following is a sympathomimetic? That could be two questions there. Uh, which group of compounds act as an anti-malarial or which specific one acts as an anti-malarial? I mean, like you've heard about quinine multiple times, so that would be fair game. Berberine is fair game. Uh, artemisin would be fair game to have that as a specific one. We talked about brassicas and some of the things that they're good for. What group of compounds are more likely to interact with adrenergic receptors or, uh, or serotonin receptors or stuff like that? Uh, um, some animals ate some plants that had high amounts of uh, some alkaloids. What group of alkaloids are most likely to cause these problems? You know, if someone has liver cancer, is it, uh, you know, you, it could be A, um, or, you know, uh, I have a question about tyramine specifically that it came up. Uh, which of the following symptoms could be produced if you ate either this drug or this drug? So I'm giving you like two of them. So uh, is it A, vomiting and diarrhea? Is it C, something else? This, so a question about either reserpine or gotamine, harmaline or ephedrine producing certain symptoms. So write down like reserpine, what does it do? Ergotamine, what does it do? Dimethyltryptophan, what does it do? Ephedrine, what does it do? You know, I'm not going to make it too specific. I'm going to, like, I'm not going to ask you every single possible symptom. Like, if you forgot that they sweat, I'm like, oh my God, did they sweat or did they not sweat? Like, that's not what I'm getting into. It's more general. Uh, something about some hallucinogens. Uh, question about isoplenolene alkaloids. Which of the following are belong to that class of compounds? What, what herbs, I mean? Uh, question about nicotine and some, something about what belongs to what her belongs to tropane alkaloids or quinolizine alkaloids. Oh, there's only 73 questions. It's supposed to be 75. I don't know why there's not 75 in my math. That's weird. Curious to see. So yeah, there's 73 questions. I'm gonna add up my uh so yeah, I gave them a breakdown that added up to 75, but the exam's only 73 questions if you're looking at that. Okay. Did that help you guys? Um are you guys still out there? 19 people somewhere. Um, I would say the best way to study is I would go through and read these questions that I posted first. And then I would read through all your notes. And I would just sort of, if you can add a few little, I would maybe answer some of these questions on here if you could. And so I would read the question first, read through the notes again, go back and read through the questions and add a few little things to those. The questions, most people usually uh, on the exams is between like 78 and 82 percent. If there's a really bad question, they'll get eliminated. You've got lots of questions, so if you lose out on, you know, if you don't answer, um, so let me see here.
So like if you get 10 questions wrong or 14 questions wrong, you're, you're still getting in the 80s. So you can still, like, you don't, you're not going to get every single question right. Most people, you know, occasionally get somebody gets perfect on the exam, but not always. So if you get a few questions wrong, don't worry. If there's some questions that aren't there, chances are it's going to be uh, uh, eliminated or neutralized. Um, so I think that's what I would do. Do you guys have any other questions before I let you go? 1230? So somebody wants me to give a breakdown again really quick. Let me just look at the, I'll just post it. Um, let me just see here. I'll post the breakdown again. I think that's an easier way for me to do it. And it'll be a rough idea, but it's pretty fair. So we have one intro lecture. So this one has 19 questions. This one, so I had 18 questions, sorry, roughly. Okay, give or take like a couple questions. Roughly 18 questions for this one. Roughly 18 to 19 questions for this PDF file. Roughly 18 or 19 questions on Phytochemicals 2 PDF. And roughly 19 questions on that one. So we had four handouts and each of them are averaging around 18, 17 to 19 questions on each of those. Does that make sense to you, Adam? Okay. So I'll go and post that uh, up there. Any other questions before you guys go? All multiple choice, yes. I want you guys to succeed. I certainly don't want anyone to fail. Uh, and I don't think there you should, but I can appreciate there's a lot of material to get through. So I'm trying not to make it hard for you guys. I really am not trying to. So I know I have a lot of information there, but I'm not wanting you uh, to fail. I want you guys to succeed. If you, so I'll get this posted right now. If you guys have any other questions, please let me know. Um, Anyways, good luck. Have a great Thanksgiving and reading week or whatever you guys have. And we will see you guys after the uh, midterm. Although, if the class rep, I don't know who the class rep is, they can send me an email and get in touch with me. I need to know if you guys want to have any more uh, in-class lectures or all remote. So that's kind of important. I need to know that as well. Okay? Uh, I guess we don't need to know right away, but it'd be good to know. So... Good luck, guys, and we'll see you in uh, a couple weeks. Or a few